Welcome to the YouTubers out there. I'm just cleaning house in here, trying to take care of uh, business. but I have not received any PDH documents. Yeah. All right, welcome to everybody. We got six people out there in YouTube land. Remember, you've got the uh, you got the live chat going. You can do that. I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, we've got a few people on WebEx already. Tell you what, Nihad, you like the early bird, buddy? Thank you for showing up again. The man. All right, I need to shut down my email because that's even more distracting than chat. Shut things down. Closing down the house. All right, if you had sent me an email on your PDH, um, I will. I have those emails. I'm going to get back to everybody who either didn't get a PDH uh, that should have or didn't get the links and things like that. So I'm working through those. Um, what I'm doing is I'm just running off of the spreadsheet that I'm doing in the beginning, the Mentimeter results from check-in, and then I do the check-in. Uh, I check the ones at the end. Uh, and when I have... Uh, I align both of those e the, the email addresses up from the beginning and the end. What I did find in some cases, um, the uh, some of you have, I guess it's, I, I call it the fat finger or probably a little bit too much caffeine. I had some double strokes in emails and things of that nature, so I got a few bounces. Um, so some of the emails weren't typed in correctly and whatnot. So um, so I'm, I'm checking in, uh, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, Thank goodness I don't have a lot of emails, uh, but uh, I will be looking at those probably later on today. So just have a little bit of patience with me. I appreciate that. Leon, what's the name of our software? Um, we don't own SKM. We own... What is the name of the software? <laughs> Can't remember. Dan O'Day. Pretty bad when you have a company that's uh, so large you can't remember your own products. Um, something that utilities use. It is called... <clears throat> Syme, please can't remember. E Y M E. All right. Yeah, we have a software application called Syme. C-Y-M-E, you can check that out. I, um, you know, again, a lot of these software applications, I I tend to migrate to SKM just uh, because I haven't installed Syme and I haven't uh, gotten it up and running. I actually have installed it. I haven't been playing with it. 
I, uh, I run home to, uh, applications that I'm most familiar with. And, you know, I was raised on, uh, I was raised on, on SKM. So that's my right now. That's where, where I'm at. Hey, Tom, this is Tim. Hey, um, I'm off mute, but, um, yep. that's one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, you know, the world is going to be modeling, um, you know, going towards the future, and you're right, utilities own, uh, do use SIME. I, I was a SIME user as well for the utility industry, but m many times what I've seen in, you know, working with the utility is I would get engineers that would ask me for, you know, what the starting point would be for their uh, short circuit analysis, their load flows, and those types of things on SKM, and it would really be great if the utility, and I threw you a couple of names like Aspen, ETAP, Sime, a few other names like that, the modeling softwares, it would really be great if the, there could be a better coordination between the electric utilities and the design engineers such, such that the utility could give the, the correct starting point so that like if you were using Easy Power or SKM or ETAP, you could take that uh, starting point given from Sime and said, okay, you know, here's your short circuit current analysis, then maybe you needed the upstream fuse of the utility uh, transformer, maybe you needed the cable limiters, you know, from the uh, uh, low voltage secondary network or, or that type of thing in order to go forward. Similarly, like from SKM and, and from ETAP, the utility needs to know some things about, you know, what the load is attached, uh, what's the interconnected generation, and a few things like that. So it would really be a two-way street um, between the two, and uh, just throw that out as an idea for uh, maybe a future project. I like that idea, and I will. Uh, I'm going to share that with our uh, our SIME team because that that could be a really good if you got uh, SIME, SKM, EDSA, Easy Power all together, and said, "How do we share information?" I know, you know, that's a really, probably a very competitive world as well. But uh, to your point, uh, the sharing of information, outputting files and importing files, especially from what the utility guys do to what the, the normal power distribution guys, that, that would be a good value. Did, did you know uh, Dr. Tom McDermott from the University of Pittsburgh? No, boy, I know the name, but I, I don't believe I've ever had the pleasure. He went with the U.S. government uh, on their modeling team. He's a modeling expert, and um, you know he worked on several different um, you know utility type softwares. And there's an, an Open DSS. There's a distribution engineering workstation. Uh, there's one other one that just slips my mind as well. But he went on into the government at um, PNNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories, and, you know, as a modeling expert. And that would be a good person to pull together. I know that, uh, like Dan Cardavalli, uh, he knows him because we've all worked at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, some of the power engineering programs. But, um, you know, that would be another good lead to pull that together. And, you know, my, my feeling is that, you know, you get the major software developers together and, you know, like almost like a code making panel. Nobody has to divulge their own modeling secrets or right. anything like that. But there needs to be a good interface between both systems from the, from the, uh, the interconnected user systems, the utility systems, and, you know, understand what needs to go forward because, you know, in the future, you know, everything's going to be done with modeling. In fact, a lot of the stuff currently is done with modeling and allowing the two models to work together um, is very beneficial. I, I did do a project once with um, um, NASA Glenn up in uh, Cleveland uh, doing some modeling work with um, – uh, Case Western Reserve, and we found that that was very difficult to, you know, while both models will output like a modeling file, you know, mm -hmm. that you could go from one system to the other, but just a simple interface between the two. You know, here's basically what you need to know from the utility. Here's basically what you need to know from the interconnection, and, um, you know, you can model that in, into the system, and that would be so much, much better. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's uh, that's good. I appreciate the feedback. Good idea. Got a guy asking about from Eventbrite. Question. File. New window. 
All right. I'm glad. So it sounds like I've got, uh, I've got a, where's my YouTube connection? Looks like I have a good connection on YouTube. I think I do. I have too many windows open. There it is. Yep. Excellent connection. Streaming. Stream is good. And uh, you guys can see the Menti code on the, on the, oh, the guys on YouTube can't. So let's fix that. There you go on YouTube. You got the uh, Menti code for regist for signing in. Uh, that's the first uh, step of this process for the the boys and girls up in Canada. Um, I have an Eventbrite guy who has a question, so I need to tend to that individual. We don't want to lose. Leave no engineer behind. Or no electrical professional behind. I hope everybody saw the Eventbrite uh, stuff. So let me get up there. I have a, I don't know how to see my questions on. Oh wait, I bet you that's an email. Texas State, Texas State University. We got universities. We got to really got to careful. These guys will keep you honest. Good morning, Ryan. I, I got to see a portion of your thing last night. Thank you. It was a good job, buddy. You looked good. Looks like you got, you look, look, look professional. Lisa, good morning. Good morning, David Engelhart. You like that scent? Y'all, you like the scroll at the bottom? <laughs> I had the scroll going on for my uh, YouTubers out there. Uh, that was, uh, that's right, I forgot it was in there. Yeah. Lou Gray Whore. Thanks for joining us. I was just doing a quick review. Where's my spreadsheet? I did a quick review this uh, this morning. I had a question about, um, it was an interesting, I got an email and they asked me who was the, who, which, like from an attendee perspective, where was the furthest geographically from uh, my location? And I started to look at all the different countries that we had involved. I have to find the one from today. Today is the 8th. 8th. I'm going to find the spreadsheet that I had open. On the 8th. This is it. Because we had, uh, <laughs> we've got some, we've got some distance players in here. Scream it out on YouTube if you're on YouTube. Uh, if you are outside of the U.S., streaming going great to New York. Excellent. Thank you, Ron Shapiro. Thanks for dialing in, buddy. Shout out to New Yorkers. You guys are going through heck these days. I, I heard Philly's uh, next on the list. I know the guys up in Detroit, Michigan, are getting hit hard with this virus thing. So stay safe and uh, and healthy, my friend, please. James Link, send me a note, buddy. I went out for uh, day two, so either either I had a different email address for you. I'm I'm trying to line up everything. Uh, so here's the here's the distance stuff, right? So we had Nicaragua, Managua, Nicaragua. That was uh, <laughs> and some of these are drives, so I had to separate these. From drive miles to air miles, uh, I couldn't figure out the air miles. 
uh, to Nicaragua, but uh, the drive miles to Nicaragua is 3,486.4 miles from Weirton, West by God, Virginia. And um, there's another drivable one in here too, which was Costa Rica, uh, 3,695.3 miles. So the driving distance winner is uh, Heredia, H-E-R-E-D-I-A. I'm not sure where that's at, Costa Rica which is at 3,695 miles away. Second place for driving is Managua, Nicaragua. And then air miles, we had uh, Port of Spain, Trinidad. That's 1,286, I guess you call that aeronautical miles, or is that an ocean thing? Oceanographical, or whatever. It's through the air. And then you had uh, Trinidad, Tobago. That's that island. And Tobago, 2,351 miles. But uh, this, uh, this one here, Tunapuna, T-U-N-A-P-U-N-A. -A -A. This would be the furthest via air. So let's, I think we looked at that one. T-U-N-A-P-U-N-A. -A -A. Trinidad and Tobago. That's, that's. Those are all pretty much, let's take a look at that one. Puna Puna. We're going to look at Wikipedia and see. There's a picture from the window of the gentleman who's, uh, or the person who is dialed in, located between St. Augustine and Trin City, largest town between San Juan and Ar Arima. An important market and commercial center, seat of the Tuna Puna. There, there it is. There's an island. It's an island. Awesome. For over 100 years, they've been a carnival venue. That's pretty cool. Let's take a look at, uh, uh, let's take a look at this one. This one is A-R-A-N-G-U-E-Z, Trinidad, I-N-I-D-A-D. -D. Take a look at this one. All right, San Juan. There we go. Okay, that must be a picture taken from the person who's online with us. Uh, thank you for put, posting that so quickly up on Wikipedia. You're awesome. So it's an English dialect. So, okay, so it's a town in Trinidad and Tobago, located in San Juan, region of St. George County. It lies within the east-west corridor, metropolitan area between... Man, I can't say some of these words. Let's take a look. Is there a map? Oh, map. All right. Oh, wait, there we go. There we go. Cool. Then we had another one. Port of Spain. Never been there, but uh, I know what it looks like. That one I was familiar with, at least. Archie Blows, Cupcake Island. There, there's a there's a trivia for you guys out there. There, the Archie Blows, Cupcake Island. What is that from? Anybody know? That's a little TV trivia. Port of Spain. Officially, the city of Port of Spain is the capital city, Trinidad and Tobago. It's the country's second largest city after San Fernando. We got to get people from San Fernando on the call. Second largest. That would be the largest. city has a municipal population. Cool beans. Well, we're learning a little bit about geography in this class. Who to thunk, huh? There's your code. Log in, get registered, or sign in for the PDH stuff. And this is what I do. So, and and this one was a little bit easier, but I did get a few emails of people who said they didn't get uh, they didn't get a PDH, which uh, I will work on that afterwards. Uh, I'm taking all those emails, and I will uh, I will uh, I will follow up on that. But uh, I'll tell you my process. I uh, I take the spreadsheet that's developed from this Mentimeter 58, 54, 20. I download that. And then at the end, I download the um, the spreadsheet from the uh, quiz. And I put both of those together. I sort by first name and last name. I put all of that into one spreadsheet. I look for everybody who was at the beginning and everybody who was, who was at the end. And... Uh, that's and I take that email address and I send it out. Now I did get about a couple bounces on email addresses, so those who are sending me a note might be um, 
might be a uh, uh, a bounce because uh, I, I I noticed I, I noticed this last uh, I think yes day before yesterday where the email I, I guess somebody must have fat fingered their uh, their email and I got a couple of extra letters in there so um, so I, I'm just taking what you guys enter so that's so if you didn't get one that means either I didn't get the the beginning email or the end email one of the two. I do have a way I can go and find uh, other information. I can just, I'll get you uh, the certificate. So send me a note if you didn't get, if you think you should have. There's also a San Juan, Puerto Rico. Excellent. Looking at the, uh, I'm looking at the YouTubers out there. Thanks, Ron, for Shapiro, for joining in. Awesome, Jackson, Ryan Jackson. Again, great, great. Uh, I love your your layout and everything. I've got to figure out how to stream out of multiple platforms, but I think uh, I think this is doing me pretty good so far. James Link, thanks to Tennessee. My wife is in love with Nashville and Franklin. I took her down there for a little after our. Uh, we had three dogs before. After the last dog, uh, Bella passed away. She was fifteen years, fourteen and a half, almost fifteen. Um. And uh, she she took her down to Nashville. We went down to Franklin, Tennessee. Absolutely loved Franklin, Tennessee. Hey, Charlie DeAngelis, I got to get up to see you, buddy. I think that's the you're in the only state I have not been in in the United States. Believe it or not, I have not been up to Maine. Maine's the only one I have not been to. Link to PDH file. Charlie, David Platt. Thanks, David, for dialing in, buddy. <laughs> David Bell, testing one, two, three. You're supposed to put up PFFT, PFFT, is this thing working? <laughs> Knoxville, Tennessee. I, I used to work, I worked uh, on the, um, I helped do a short circuit and coordination study and load flow study on the, on the, uh, a plant down in Murrayville that was, um, man, I can't think of the name of the plant now. Who's gone it? I got lost in the loop. They have a little uh, loop down there. I wanted to see bears. This was back in the early 90s. The guys told me, go down to that loop and um, and you'll see bears. So I went in after work. I took an exit on a little road called an old dirt road. It was called Old Country Road, I think it was. That was a trip. Never do that one again. I was on I was on empty too. I had a knock on the door of some shack and I didn't know if I was gonna make it out of there, but I did. Nice people in Tennessee. The guy would have uh given me gas out of his car if I if you if I asked, I bet. Oh yeah, James. Uh, uh, I forgot to attach the Excel spreadsheet to my last email. If you click on the link and scroll down, the there is an Excel spreadsheet that's in that drive. Forgot about that. Sorry about that. Oh, you live in Franklin, Jose. Well, I mean, you know what? My wife and I are coming down to visit you, buddy. <laughs> she loves Franklin. It is beautiful. We were in a uh, Brad Paisley music video. We went down there on a Saturday right before Easter a few years ago, and they were closing off their streets, and I asked why, and they said, Brad Paisley is going to make a music video, and we stuck around, and we're in it. Hey, Isabella, thank you for joining us. Lisa Koyan, suburb of Kansas City. Awesome. Excellent. All right, we're getting everybody dialing in. I'm liking this. I've got a good stream, an excellent stream, it says. We have 150, 156 people on YouTube. Everybody hopefully sees the, uh, the Mentimeter code for sign-in. 
Keith Van Dorn, uh, send me a note, please. Uh, you have you, everybody should have my email address. Just send me an email. I'm going to go through them uh, probably today. But, but you know, have a little patience with me. If you didn't get it and you send me a note, I will not forget about you. You're in a special folder. Yep, it's not that circular one that's under my desk either. It's a special folder on my computer. Try a direct download instead of the Dropbox link. <laughs> I will do that. The only problem with the direct down... Oh, yeah. So if you're... If you go onto Dropbox, I think you have a choice of either... Yeah, either putting it into your Dropbox or or whatever. Vernon Lippert. I'm going to have to mute you, buddy. Unless you actually want to say something. Yeah. Oh, these are in alphabetical order. Let's see. Oh, thank you for muting yourself. Um, I have to know the alphabet first, so that's a good thing. All right. I'm sharing my screen. We got four more minutes. Looks like we got a good. Um, heard someone else. Please remember to mute. I have everybody muted on uh, when they come in, so. Jim Williams, West by God, Virginia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Jim, if you were still in Australia, you would probably be the furthest. We haven't reached down to Australia yet. There's a goal. I, I consider that a goal. All right, we got a lot of good people here. Man. If you sent me an email about a PDH, I have it, and I will get to you. Virtue, thank you very much. Three more minutes. Looks like everything is good. Ryan Jackson joined us today. Luis, Luis Diego. Chico, I think it is. Um, thank you for joining us. Okay, okay. We now have 184 on YouTube. Good stuff. <coughs> Heard someone else. Little WebExer unmuting themselves. Send us a little cough. Greenville, South Carolina. I've been there. South Carolina's beautiful state. Mr. Tom Boyle. Thank you, sir. Hello. Oh, we've got a lot of great people. The Kansas City represented. Kansas City, Missouri. Is it Missouri or is it Missouri? I think it depends on how long you've lived there. Murfreesboro. I go uh, every now and then. We get down there for um, the IEI, Susan. Scarcity, we do the, uh, I, I used to do a lot of the uh, Tennessee chapter meetings. Got to get back down there to the Tennessee chapter meetings. They have a place they take us for dinner. I can't think of the name of it, but it's, it's like an old shop uh, grocery store, and they have great food. They've always got somebody playing the guitar there and singing. Love it. Somebody had asked me about how do they get a uh, notification of these events, and uh, the only thing I can tell you is I, I don't do a newsletter. I just don't have time for a newsletter. Uh, but I do um, keep my LinkedIn and my Facebook sites up to date, and I put some notes on my YouTube. I have a little of an overview. And if you go to the YouTube, what I do is I create a, um, I create like a future meeting, and what you can do is uh, hit it, and in, and it'll tell you when when we go live. All right, it is uh, I think twelve o'clock. 
Okay. Let's um let's get this let's get this show started. I think I gotta do one, no, oh, three. No. Oh, yep. All right, I'm going to uh take that menti code, so write it down if you didn't get it. And maybe write it down in case someone goes on and asks and, and uses the chat to ask the question about it. So we are going to move into our program. Okay, welcome to NEC 2020. We're continuing our discussion from the last two days. This is day three. I got, uh, I've got a good lineup. Uh, here's just a, a little overview of the sections I think we're going to be able to cover. We're going to cover um, reconditioned equipment, obviously. We're, we're going to hit that right off the bat. Take care of that. Nail that one. 210.8, we'll talk about GFCIs and some of the, the GFCIs have considerably expanded uh, in this um, in this section. Post my song, Lewis, I, I, I'm not going to do it. I'll do it at the end. I'll do it at the end. Yep. Thank you, though. Uh, 210.8, 215.9, We'll go into 625 and 555. I don't know if you guys uh, are, are friends with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. I just posted uh, Lucas Ritz's story. Uh, it moved me many years ago to uh, to really focus on marinas and try to see what we can do on marinas. And I have, and I've told everybody on the phone and and online, my uh, the Joe Fellow and and our story on how we uh, we got some things started around marinas. So that is a uh, a very I think a very important and um, it's a little emotional, but uh, but it's a good story that that we should learn something from because uh, you know marinas can be a very dangerous place. 210.5, we're going to be in 210 uh, a little bit today, a lot probably today, 215 and some Chapter 6 stuff and 5 stuff. So uh, I'm going to bounce around. I know we have a lot of industrials on the phone, so I, but I'm not sure how much uh, resi. I should do a little poll to see what you guys are want to see. But um, that's sort of the, the, re, the, what do you call that, the, um, the menu for today. Um, we're going to talk a lot about GFCIs, branch circuits, feeder circuits, things like that. Uh, as as always, everybody's phone's muted except mine, which I'm sure a lot of you would love to put that tape over my mouth. But uh, please use the chat. And I know you guys are most, all of you are really good. And, and a lot of you are just following this through. So we sort of got this done. Uh, this is my obligatory. I am not speaking on behalf of any of the committees I sit on or rep or or, uh, or represent. I am not uh, speaking on behalf of uh, of my Hello, Codemaking Panel 2 and 10 members. Uh, I've just joined Codemaking Panel 10, so I will be in the book for uh, the 2023 cycle. Uh, but I've sat around pan Panel 10 a lot. I've been, I've been heavily engaged with the development of the section stuff there. Uh, but I don't speak on, for, on behalf of any of those members or NFPA, any of that stuff. So these are all my opinions, and everybody's got one. I, again, I can't say much. I can't say enough about IAEI, NFPA, and IEEE, three good organizations, especially that one on the left, IAEI, the International Association of Electrical Inspectors, really important organization that I know as, as power engineers and as a lot of the facility guys probably never heard of that organization. Uh, I did not until a certain part of my career, but it wasn't until that I got involved with that organization that I made so many great friends and I learned so much about the National Electrical Code. A great organization to be a part of. All right, so we, we went through all of this stuff. I'm going to hit uh, the reconditioned equipment uh, first, right out of the chutes. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, misconceptions, I think, about the reconditioned equipment uh, discussions and, and the requirements, and I'm hopefully going to help dispel uh, those myths. So I split the reconditioned equipment changes into three areas. Uh, some of the general requirements, which I throw in the definition, and um, and and also what's in found in Article One Hundred and Ten. That's that's the requirements, and the definition is really important because just like anything in the National Electrical Code, you know, I often say that um, I often say that 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 people don't. You, you don't need a definition until you have a requirement, right? So what drove a lot of, what drives a lot of definitions in the NEC are the ground fault uh, requirements. And all of a sudden you say, I have a ground fault requirement in an area of the house, say, say a, a laundry room. And all of a sudden, I don't know what a laundry room is. 
Or no, no, you know what? We expanded GFCIs in basements. Well, what do you what do you call a basement? I don't think that's a basement. So, and that's what drives the definitions because you have a rule, and it, and and what gets you into that rule is the definition. So we're going to spend a little time on the definition, and then the other two areas are the areas of what cannot be reconditioned and what can be reconditioned or what is permitted to be reconditioned. So, um, because so those are the three buckets I put things into, and uh, you know we'll see how this goes. And you may uh, you may have your own take on this, but this is the uh, this is the definition, and I'm going to walk through sentence by sentence because. It's, that's the only way I, I, I'm a simple guy and I have to break things down into uh, things that I can, I can chew and understand. The first sentence, what does it tell me? Electromechanical systems. Those two words, that is a very comprehensive. Electromechanical systems. That's a, that's a very broad uh, statement from an electrical perspective. Equipment, apparatus, or components that are restored to operating conditions. So that tells me that for me to get into the reconditioned for me to get into the reconditioned requirements i have to take a product or electromechanical system or some piece of equipment and take it from a non-working state to a operating state or from a non-working to working or a non-operational condition to a operational condition so that's the first part of the definition that would rule out reusing any product Right, so if I take a circuit breaker that's perfectly fine out of a panel board, set it on the shelf, and use it a month later or two months later, put it back into the into another panel board, that is um, that is reusing equipment. I didn't take it from a state that wasn't working and put it into a state that is working. So uh, that is not reconditioning that circuit breaker. Okay, so now the second sentence says the process differs from normal servicing of equipment that remains within a facility or replacement of listed equipment on a one-to-one -one basis. So I could I, I could break this down first before that, everything up to the first comma, that this process differs from a normal servicing of equipment that remains within a facility. So you have a you have a uh, you have a piece of equipment in your facility that is uh uh, that you are going to, pro to perform maintenance on. You're going to take it down, clean it up, and do all that great stuff. This is normal servicing of that equipment, and it's in your facility. Now, the moment you take it out of your facility, you're sending it to somebody else, uh, then you're starting to get into this uh, little bit of a gray area. But um, most of this stuff that we work on, especially if it's in, you know fixed in place, you're not going to be removing that. You're not going to take a piece of switch gear and say, I'm going to ship this off to uh, eat and have them look at this and bring it back again. That doesn't happen. You may do that with power circuit breakers, insulated case circuit breakers, and, and other components, but uh, you're not going to do that with normal equipment. And then it says, or replacement of listed equipment on a one-to-one -one basis. Oh, we got somebody who's off mute. Then you're... Put yourself on mute. Thank you very much. Yeah, I tell you what, I got to give you, commend you guys on WebEx. You're doing a great job at watching that mute button. I really appreciate it. So uh, if, I am, if I am taking, uh, say for example, I am, uh, I'm going to take a circuit breaker and I'm going to follow the manufacturer's instructions and I'm going to ins install or make a change on that circuit breaker that's a part of that listing and it's a part of the manufacturer's instructions. I am, I'm doing something that is normal servicing. If, if, for example, I have a motor starter inside of a motor control center, and for some reason the motor starter fails, then I'm going to replace that motor starter. I take the motor starter out. I have a brand new one. I put it in. I have replaced a component one for one inside of a bucket, inside of an M MCC. Uh, that would fall into replacement of listed equipment on a one-to-one -one basis. Now, if I took that motor starter that failed and took it apart, put a new coil in there, do whatever I needed to do to that starter and put it all back together again. I have just taken it from a non-working piece of equipment to a working piece of equipment and I have made, um, and I've reconditioned it. Now it's important that you separate this definition from any other definitions that you may have in your mind. So you may have another document, say from 
um, some other standard or from another organization or a part of your own procedures that may say what you're doing in your facility is uh, is reconditioning, all right? And and you may say, well, doing performing regular maintenance on my equipment is is considered reconditioning because it says so in this other document. None of that really matters when it comes to the National Electrical Code because the NEC is going to look at its definition of what reconditioned is. And that's the critical part of this whole thing. you got to look at this definition. You Even if you want to call what you're doing to your equipment reconditioned, if it doesn't meet this definition, then the National Electrical Code is not going to uh, consider it as being reconditioned. Now, that doesn't mean you still can't do some of the things that the NEC is telling you to do because uh, it's it's good for safety. but um, but it just means that an, an, an authority having jurisdiction or electrical inspector would not be able to cite the NEC as you uh, as a violation of what you're doing because you haven't met this definition. Hopefully that hopefully that makes sense. And, and like I say, everybody has an opinion on that one. Now, there is an informational note that says the term reconditioned is frequently referred to as rebuilt, refurbished, or remanufactured. So if I have a uh, if I if I if I have an organization that says, well, we don't recondition, we remanufacture, that would still fall into this definition of being reconditioned. So it's really important that we understand this definition before you get anywhere else. And and I've had discussions with people. They'll tell me, uh, they'll give me examples of what they're doing, and I'll say, well, that doesn't meet the definition. Uh, you know, reusing. I get that all the time. You mean to tell me I can't take a breaker out of my panel board and and uh, take it over to another facility in my in my facility and and use it there? I'm like, well, no, I'm not telling you, you can't do that. You can do that. Uh, you haven't met the definition of reconditioned, and, and 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 so you're not even into any of the requirements. But if you do meet this re this definition, then we're going to start talking about 110 uh, requirements and then some of the other sections in the National Electrical Code that tells you whether or not you can or can't. Now, actions, again, if you follow manufacturer's instructions to install accessories in a variety of equipment, installing shunt trip, uh, for example, in a molded case circuit breaker is, uh, is, is one of those examples that you'd say, well, you know, this process looks pretty intrusive, Tom. You'll say uh, you're taking the front of this breaker off and uh, and and you're exposing a lot of the parts inside. You've got to remove all these screws. Now, the key thing about this is this product was designed to be opened this way. There are a lot of multi case circuit breakers, and you'll see the little stickers on the side. The screws weren't designed to be taken out and put back in again. Those are like some of those are self tapping screws or they're rivets, and you can't take them out and you can't put them back in, and they they're not going to hold like the they would have in. Uh, from an original manufacturer's perspective. So what I'm showing here is that you're, you're taking this front of this circuit breaker off, you're following the manufacturer's instructions, you're putting in the, um, uh, the accessories in, in the prescribed manner that the, uh, from an instructions perspective that they're telling you to, uh, how they tell you to do it. There are specific provisions. Like I said, the screws are one. There are slots on the side that uh, tell you how to, um, how to, uh, take that in and out and and how to take the wires out the side so uh and 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 they tell you they'll, they'll tell you how to uh, what the torques requirements and specifications are so this process and there's no seal on the side of these breakers because we we anticipate that at some point you're going to be replacing those or adding accessories to these uh to these breakers so that's just uh, one aspect of what would not be considered because you're, again, you're following manufacturer's instructions. Now, 90.7 didn't change this cycle. And that's another one of the little articles you can cross off that we looked at. Uh, this, is, this didn't change this cycle, but I'll tell you what's important about it is that the authority having jurisdiction, the electrical inspector or your plant manager, whoever your AHJ is, is going to use this section to make some decisions on what they're looking at. And remember, the, what this section of the code tells us is that the intent of the code is, the, is that factory installed internal wiring, this is what basically says if they're looking at a listing mark, and as long as you didn't modify it, 
then they're not going to be going into that uh, listed solution and say, well, that wire is not the right size wire, or this wire doesn't look like it has the right insulation uh, because it's tested as a unit and it's approved as part of the listing requirement. Uh, but if they detect alterations or damage to that equipment, so they, they're looking at a piece of equipment, they see the manufacturer's label on it, but then they see this other label from a different person who says they uh, refurbished and reconditioned it. Okay, that uh, would indicate to them that they're going to have to take some, pay some closer attention to what was done on that equipment. This is when the inspector could say, look, you're going to need a field evaluation because uh, you cut some holes in the back of this panel that you shouldn't have, uh, or you tap that bus, which uh, is not listed. It's not shown as a location on the bus to be tapped. Uh, things like that. This is what drives field evaluations and changes. Whenever you modify a piece of equipment in the field, you're, you, are, you are going outside of how that product was listed and tested as the manufacturer, outside of the, the manufacturer's instructions. Uh, then you're going to, they're going to use 90.7 to say you need to get that looked at. Now, if you're following a manufacturer's instructions, you can add ground bars and things like that. We sell accessories all of that good stuff. If you're adding those accessories per manufacturer's instructions, that wouldn't be a modification that uh, would, would flag them. So this is 120, 110.21. And I'll tell you, uh, from the language perspective, this is what was added in the 2020 cycle. The, the, the 2017 cycle said, now, once you meet the definition of reconditioned, then you have to do certain things. The 17... Uh, version of the code told us up in the top of this uh, of this document uh, of this the very parent text it says marked with the name trademark or other descriptive markings by which the organization responsible for reconditioning uh, can be identified so what this is doing i i call this transparency because what, what, what the code is basically trying to do is say, look, you're going to, it's, if you're going to recondition this equipment, which it may be perfectly fine, you have to, um, you're going to have to put your name on it. Because no, you own it, right? Think about it. You uh, take a power circuit breaker that was built in the 50s or 60s, you bring it back to your house or your garage or your facility your professional facility, you take it all apart, replace new parts, you build, make your own little parts, put it all back together again, the original listing mark, the original manufacturer can't be held liable for what you've just done with that product. So they want to make sure that, uh, that they drive transparency. So you're going to put your name on it if you do that work to it, um, which if you're not willing to put your name on it, then you, know, you have to ask the question, why? Uh, but and and it, and and the date that you did the reconditioning that is just all about keeping things transparent so that the end user knows what they've got the contractor knows what they bought and um and if anything happens to it they know who to go back to because now you have all the specifications now the other thing they added this year in this cycle was to remove the listing mark and this generated some uh, dialogue and concern and i think personally in my opinion everybody who that i've talked to that raised concern about this um, after you explain uh, the definition and you explain what this is all about, it, it becomes a lot easier to understand and, and, and it's much more palatable. But the original listing mark, once you take this thing apart, once you break it, take it from a state that wasn't working and put it into a state that is working, that original listing mark is no longer valid. Uh, it was only valid from the, the original manufacturer when it's shipped from the plant. The moment it gets out there in the field, and it starts to get living experience. Uh, it's it's not really a a uh, it's not giving you the value anymore. And then what you don't want to do is do ref refurbishing and reconditioning and leave that mark on it. And then the end user thinks that it's a UL listed product and it got a third party review after you did your change and you did your magic on it. Um, so uh, the original listing mark will have to come off as part of the 2020 code cycle. That presents a challenge, and I think a lot of the pushback came back from uh, the motor guys who do a lot of re refurbishing, you know, uh, what do they call that, rewinding motors. Um, and, uh, and so their, their concern was that when you look at the motors, motors have 
uh, the UL listing mark a part of the nameplate. And that is a concern because how do I remove it and, and, and or obliterate it? So, you know, that's a challenge in my opinion. I don't think an AHJ would be, would push back if you, uh, instead of cutting a metal plate out of that nameplate, if you cover and uh, make it so that that it looks like that uh, li old listing mark is no longer applicable. I've heard the term obliterate you used, uh, you know, mark it up, score it or whatever. Um, but in a lot of cases, when they work on those motors, they put a new label on it anyway, because some of those motors, they don't have the same horsepower rating that they had when they, when they were old. Uh, so they change a lot of that. Um, so, and again, uh, reconditioning of equipment cannot perform uh, destructive tests. So the other thing that they have in there is they say, uh, reconditioned equipment shall not be based solely on the equipment's original listing. And the reason is because, again, they can't do the testing that's done uh, as part of a manufacturer uh, because we do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of destructive tests and things like that on a lot of different samples off of the line. That's not going to happen on this. Uh, but there are other things that they can do. So, uh, and there are standards that UL has and that for uh, a lot of this equipment to provide guidance for when they look at a piece of equipment that was reconditioned. And there are uh, options to get a relisting as reconditioned, and we're going to talk about that as well. Uh, so the, uh, the exception basically looks at industrial occupancies where conditions of maintenance and supervision ensure that only qualified persons service the equipment so you may be doing something in your heavy industrial that meets the definition of reconditioned, but uh, because you're in a heavy industrial, you have conditions of maintenance and supervision, you have qualified persons, uh, they know that the equipment uh, that you're working on, they're giving you the exception that you don't have to worry about A2 um, uh, with regard to the labeling and marking and uh, equipment that is reconditioned for the owner or operator as part of a regular equipment maintenance program. So uh, that is an exception for the industrials. That's a little bit different of an environment. But I can tell you this is, there's a, there's a task group looking at this right now, and I think some of this language, uh, they're talking about a TIA, a technical interim amendment. And if you don't know what a TIA is, uh, a TIA, uh, let's talk about that just for a second. So a TIA is a way to change the code midstream. Uh, if you find that there's a safety concern because of some language in the code or something that needs to be in the code or changed in the code because of safety, there's a sense of urgency and, um, and it passes that, there's a couple criteria that it has to pass. You can uh, create a TIA, you get a few people to sign off on it from the code panel uh, or the core lane committee. It gets submitted to the code making panel. They review it. It gets out to the public. They all, everybody gets a chance to take a look at this, and they get public review. And it uh, it can actually change the national electrical code and be it's a it's a voted on, etc. Now you may be looking at your book, and you say, "Well, I've got my 2020 version of my national electrical code, and there are TIAs out there on the website that have passed, um, or there are." Um, changes in the book that, that just erratas, erratas, however you want to say it. Um, so uh, those erratas, when, when they're updated, the online version uh, the, of the National Electrical Code, which is, again, it's, it's not going to be a, um, it's, uh, the code is no longer a um, PDF. There's no PDF of the National Electrical Code, but there is a, an online version that you have access to and uh, for free as well uh, as um, and here's, here's the, uh, here's the online version of that. Let me maximize that. So this is uh, from my, I have a subscription to it and I would highly, Oh, somebody's off mute. I want to, it's a nasty cough. Um, in any case, you have uh, access to this. Now there is a free version of this as well. Uh, but you'll have access to this this document once the once the TIA is passed, uh, they update the online versions of the National Electrical Code, so you have all of those changes uh, built into this document that's online. Obviously, they can't update your book, so 
uh, it's, it's important to understand that that gets updated. Now, the other problem that you run into is code adoption. Uh, you oh, someone's coughing. I don't know who that was, but, uh, please mute yourself. Doesn't sound good. So, uh, if, if a state adopts, like say Massachusetts, for example, they're an early adopter of the code. When they adopt that version of the code, they have their Massachusetts code. TIAs, erratas, and things like that don't automatically get uh, enforced and accepted into their program. Um, so in many states, it, those TIAs would have to be voted on uh, because it's a process from a code adoption perspective. So you got a little bit, be a little bit careful there. Um, but uh, sometimes what is, what is updated helps you. Sometimes it hurts you. <laughs> you may or may not want to uh, fight that battle. So be careful what you ask for is, uh, is a key uh, phrase that you'll hear in the code world. So in any case, um, you have an exception for your industrials. All right, reconditioned equipment. Uh, and they have a couple informational notes. Um, the term reconditioned may be interchangeable with the term. So remember, in the definition, we saw informational note number two, they moved that also over in 110.21. They're hammering a point, a point home. Uh, it doesn't have to be in both locations, but it's good that it is. Raises the awareness. And, that, and they tell you that the original listing mark may include the mark of the certifying body and not the entire equipment label. So that's another big misconception uh, that occurs is when you say, you know, remove the listing mark. And they'll say, well, you know, the listing mark is a part of my manufacturing label. That doesn't mean you take the whole label off. You just obliterate or get rid of the listing mark. Now, in some cases, uh, the listing mark may, may be a part of the plastic or thermoset, whatever it's made out of, the body of the product. Uh, it might be something that is etched in there. The only way to remove that would be to cross it out um, in some form or fashion. You don't want to ruin the integrity of the product and things like that. Don't create a problem trying to take something off. So uh, that's another important thing to remember. So, so that's basically the definition, and that's the requirement. Um, just adding transparency. Equipment, uh, now, now the, the other category is what is in the code that says it shall not be uh, permitted to be refur refurbished. Now, the products I'm showing you on the, on the screen right now, the equipment, uh, like these uh, ground fault circumferences, receptacles, and things like that, I don't know who would waste their time uh, refurbishing and reconditioning these. You're probably getting into the reusing of these. That's a probably that's more likely than anything else. Uh, I would say always be mindful if you're reusing, you, make sure you know the history of that product uh, because that breaker can look like it's brand new because it was just washed because it was in a flood. Um, uh, you don't know what's going on on the inside. If you don't know the history of that, if you're not getting it from a qualified or um, a um, the uh, authentic, uh, you're not getting authentic product from a from a, a retail or a distributor that is qualified to handle those products from the manufacturers of those products. Then uh, be very careful. Equipment because you don't know the history. Uh, also, your your AFCIs uh, and your GFCIs. So 210.15 has a requirement that says you cannot refurbish or recondition arc fault circuit interrupters. Then 210.15. Remember, this is 210 branch circuits. We talk about ground fault protection of equipment and the electronic trip units and whatnot. You know, this might be, uh, I know we're talking about, uh, is this the right place for uh, some of these requirements? For example, you know, in, in the branch circuit 210, we have, uh, we have a multi case circuit breaker that's a GFCI, and we have a receptacle that's a GFCI. Well, there are, in Article 240, that talks about overcurrent protection, and in 406, which talks about wiring devices, those already have requirements that says you can't recondition or refurbish receptacles or multi-case circuit breakers. So uh, there's probably no need to have it in 215. But we wanted to make sure that, you know, you may have a, you may have a GFCI product that's not one of those and not covered. So I guess it doesn't hurt to have it there. Uh, and then this talks about the GFPE. All right, now equipment, again, uh, you're not going to take these fuses apart. Take the sand out, look at the element, put it back together, and put it back in service. Ain't going to happen. Um, low voltage fuse holders, you don't want to be, uh, you know, if you broke off, uh, if on your fuse holder one of the clips broke, you're not going to repair that in the lab. 
Um, that's just because they, they, they follow the rules and whatnot. That's just something that's not going to, I don't see it getting reconditioned either. And again, we say non-renewable fuses, obviously, uh, the, re the renewable ones, uh, they're still out there and you don't, don't have to worry about that. You can still put new elements in. So multi-case circuit breakers in 24088. Uh, now the trick here, here's the, here's the, I think the, the, the important thing to remember that insulated case circuit breakers are listed to UL489, and that is a molded case product. So I'm showing our our little BR breakers, the residential, all the way up through the big RD breaker. I think that's an RD breaker, which is our one of our big, which is our biggest molded case circuit breaker. But the, you got to remember that an insulated case circuit breaker is also a molded case circuit breaker because an insulated case circuit breaker is listed to UL489. And if you don't know the differences there, you're really going to want to be in tomorrow's session. What's tomorrow? Tomorrow, Thursday? Yeah, it's Thursday. Wow, today's Wednesday. So tomorrow's session is on uh, Circuit Breaker Basics. And uh, I'll send, I think I sent everybody uh, a link to that, uh, that event as well. Low voltage power circuit breakers that have electronic trip units. Now, uh, these electronic trip units, when you start seeing electronics, you're not going to be taking electronics parts, soldering on the board, and putting those things back into service. These are very critical for arc flash reduction and things of that nature. Uh, you're not permitted. You may be permitted to recondition a power circuit breaker, but you're not permitted to uh, recondition these trip units. And, and you can purchase new trip units that are retrofitable on retrofitable. That's a word, retrofitable. Someone looked that up. Uh, in any case, you can uh, you you can buy products that can be put into other into your power circuit breakers. Medium voltage fuse holders and fuses, no different than the low voltage stuff. You're not going to take those things apart. That would be ungood. Receptacles in 406.3. Do I don't know who would waste their time. Do not do that. You just that would be ungood as well. Attachment plugs in 406 panel boards. You can't recondition and refurbish a panel board. Now, I was con I, when when I first saw a lot of people arguing against uh, reconditioning, I went and I sat with a few people that do reconditioned work. Uh, we've got one close to Pittsburgh here that we work with closely, and I asked them, you know, what about panel boards? Because I was thinking that panel boards is one. That's one of those uh, uh, pieces of uh, products that you would take out of an installation and reuse it. And they they don't they told me they don't waste their time on panel boards. Um, they they are more interested in the larger breakers and things like that. So uh, panel boards are just uh, you know you have to look at your cost benefit. Is it really worth taking something apart that's really not that expensive to begin with? Luminaires, lamp holders, and retrofit kits. Now retrofit kits you can you can take a luminaire, you can take the lamp holders, you can take the uh, LED retrofits and put them into uh, the system. They're all listed products. What you can't do is take that retrofit kit, retrofit kit apart. Remember, if that retrofit kit, you go to install it, you dropped it, you broke it, right? You broke a little plastic piece off and you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna super glue this thing back together again and put it back, back up in the light. That's ungood, not good. You have taken it from a non-working state to a working state. You've met the definition. And based on 410.7, it tells you you cannot do what you're doing. So stop. All right. Equipment not permitted to be reversed. Again, listed low voltage lighting systems or lighting system assembled from listed parts. Our pump controllers, obvious reason. And any of the transfer switches in the 700, 701, 702, 708, you're not, I've seen people make their own transfer switches. Uh, not good. We're not going to let that happen, and we're not going to let you take an automatic transfer switch that's in a, especially a life safety system or a fire pump controllers and fire pump uh, uh, transfer switches and take them apart and fix them and say, yep, I'm good to go. That's not going, that's just ungood. Let's see if ungood's a word too. Equipment permitted to be refurbished. Now this stuff is, now let me, let me, uh, let me just, we got to remember, a lot of people say, well, you know, I looked in 240, 88, and it says I can refurbish, recondition power breakers. I can refurbish and recondition high voltage breakers. I can refurbish and recondition uh, switch boards and switch gear. But, you know, there's nothing in here that says I can refurbish and recondition my motor. 
And then my response to that is that says there's nothing in there that says that you can't. So if the code is silent on it, that, that means you don't have anything in the NEC that says you can't do something. So if you have a motor, if you have something that uh, a safety disconnect switch, I don't know, I don't believe safety disconnect switches are in here anywhere. Uh, if you don't have language in the Na National Electrical Code that says you cannot refurbish or recondition something, then there's no prohibition on it. Um, but what it does mean that if you do recondition it, then you've got to go back to 110, put your name and number on it and the date that you did it and remove the original listing mark, right? So that's your only gotcha. And then what might hurt you is that if in the code it says that the product shall be listed, and you remove the listing mark because you recondition it, that may prevent you from installing it per the National Electrical Code because an electrical inspector is going to go, that's not a listed product, but it says it needs to be listed in this book. Now, having said that, it's there. not all products have to be listed. There's, a, there's some misconceptions about that as well. Now, uh, the, the AHJ is going to use the listing mark because... Uh, in chapter in our in, in article ninety, remember the the that are that's the article we go dumpster diving for. Uh, that'll tell you that they're going to have to approve it, and they're going to have to look for something. And if the if you've built something or you have um, you have modified something, uh, a product, and you're installing it, they're going to look at it and they're going to say, "What gives me the them the level of confidence that it's going to do what it's supposed to do?" They usually look for the listing mark, and if it's got a listing mark, they're good. If it doesn't have a listing mark, they're not going to want to crawl out on that limb too far, right? Unless they really love you. Uh, you you want to limit their crawling out on that limb by getting some sort of listing mark or some sort of third-party uh, review of what you're doing. And they may ask for a field evaluation. Now, I know we've got some AHJs on the, on the line. I mean, and if you can add your thoughts on that, into the chat session or the the individuals who might be out there on electrical inspectors it'd be interesting to say how do you handle uh the uh the, that modified product are you looking for a listing even if it's not required do you require it some local jurisdictions shelby county alabama i know donnie cook will tell me not in shelby county alabama it ain't happening here because they require that listing mark on a lot of things above and beyond what the national electrical code uh, requires so uh, be mindful of that, that he, you know, when you remove that mark, that's uh, a part of some of the pushback uh, that you may not, you may have to show, or you may have to do a little field evaluation or, or, or something of that nature based upon the inspector's uh, position on that. So again, there are many areas in the NEC where refurbish and recondition is not mentioned. Uh, without any mention of it, there's no prohibition, right? It's just like anything. If you, if there's no speed limit posted, uh, if there's no, if there's nothing that says you can't walk on someone's property, there's no laws that somebody can't state, then they're going to have a hard time on the witness stand. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, that's what a, you know, uh, when, now what I'm talking to, you know, we do a lot of reconditioning ourselves. Um, this is a, a circuit breaker that we reconditioned. It was, a, I don't know what vintage that is, but that's a, that's a 1950s or so probably uh, based upon the looks of it. And um, in some cases, it's probably better than it was back then because, you know, you've got a state-of-the-art uh, electronic trip unit on it. Uh, it's all, uh, all of the components on it are, are, you know, in really good shape. And, you know, these things can be reconditioned and refurbished. Um, but, um, you know, remember, too, they can take a new breaker and make it so that it fits in your existing equipment. So you'll have to weigh, do I just buy a new breaker and retrofit that into my equipment? Or do I take this breaker out, have it reconditioned, and put that back in? So in any case, that is a that is a uh, decision that would have to be made uh, by the owners and whoever is making that decision. This is an example of a GFCI receptacle. I know we talked about a little bit about this on, in our short circuit discussions. Well, maybe that was, maybe that was Monday. That was last week. Uh, about welded contacts on GFCIs. Remember that push to test me, the, the self-testing feature on GFCIs um, does not mean that um, you don't have to push that test button. This is a case of uh, a contact that was welded. Now, you know, I took this apart because I was just interested in what was going on inside. And um, 
I would not say you would want to file that down and get it back in service again. And I'll tell you what, taking one of these apart, I don't care. I, I, have, I have a new earned respect for the people on the plant floor that put these things together because, you know, it's just like anything I work on. I have more parts left over than when, than when I started. Uh, I have a pickup truck in my garage I'm going to be putting together in, in the next couple of weeks, and I've got more parts than I started out with. Uh, you can retrofit these electronic units. That electronic unit cannot be reconditioned or refurbished based on 24088. So you're going to buy a new one, and there's kits, there's instructions. They're beautiful. You can add the new arc reduction technologies on there. There's lots of great things that you can do with uh, with an older breaker. This is uh, the case of uh, the case of the um, of the reconditioned uh, uh, lineup. You know that shows the uh, that shows uh, an existing. You know this is in our experience center up in Pittsburgh, um, uh, but it shows you what can be done. Uh, to equipment, how you can make it look. So that's reconditioned equipment. I'm just going to take a quick look at the chats. So bear with me here. I got a lot of good mornings. Um, uh, take a link, the PDH. Uh, Nashville's my favorite. Yep, Tom, just an FYI. All right, Jeff Fecto, Mr. Fecto. Thanks, that's you well represented. I really appreciate you being online. I, we had Local 11 on yesterday. Thank you, Local 11 and, and Local 98 for showing up, too. I'm sure you guys are probably on the, on the line somewhere. All right, so there's a lot of discussion about the PDHs. Don, can I have linked direct download option? Thank you. Don, um, would you entertain the IEI Pine Tree chapter meeting in WebEx? Or is it absolutely? I'd love, I'd love to do that, Charlie. Yep. Monday's link. So you guys are sharing the links. I love the uh, I love the back and forth. There's some codes. I agree, but perhaps not for a reason. One-to-one th -one basis. So I agree, but perhaps not for the reason you think. It's not clear to me that a one-to-one -one basis is identical to replacing with an identical rated product. Uh, Mr. David Shapiro. Um, and Don Guineer are going at it. Uh, perhaps the answer is, uh, yeah, that's good. What is it when I modernize or upgrade working equipment? So, you know, if you, uh, here's what I, here's my, here's my thought. Like if I have my, my panel board, my panel board has, uh, you know, I have a CH, uh, Eaton CH panel board, tan box, copper bus, a whole bit. If one of my breakers isn't working and I take that breaker out and I see that it is a uh, CH 15 or a CH 20, and it's a 10 ka interrupting rating i take and i go to the supply house i get a replacement for that i bring it in and i put a new one in that's a one for one replacement if i had a motor starter a heater element my heater element had an issue i take the heater element out i look at the catalog number i buy a new halo heater element i put it in and i i install that i've done a one for one replacement so uh, those are some examples uh, okay, definition of a uh, utility issue. I think it was an issue with, okay, I'm looking, there's some good dialogue going on, just uh, changing a coil or contacts in a starter recondition. Changing a coil for voltage reasons, reconditioned, confusing. Uh, yep, I know, David. Uh, again, what I would fall back on, do you have manufacturer's instructions on how to do something? If you have manufacturer's instructions, more than likely that has been uh, UL reviewed and it's a part of the listing. And I know it's confusing, um, but again, if you just break it down, comment on listings either available or required for low voltage motor control centers, vertical section listing versus individual. Oh, yes. So this is an interesting one. I learned this recently. You know, I, I think back to uh, I worked at, uh, at a, a power plant uh, down in Florida, and we did... Um, we took cubicles out of motor control centers and we uh, you know, changed the parts out. We renewed everything, got it, put it all back together again. I never really realized that that cubicle is listed as a product. So the MCC itself, the structure is listed. Each individual cube uh, bucket is a listed solution. So you could go back to the manufacturer and you could say, I want to uh, buy a, a bucket with certain components in it. And here's the critical part. I was actually online. Somebody sent me a link. And uh, there was a gentleman, a company, it looked like a very formal company, 
very proud of the fact that they got like three variable frequency drives into one cubicle of the MCC. Um, and, and, and we laughed at that because there are so many things you've got to think about. Heat, for one, right? We have to, when you, when you list that bucket, you have to put it through certain standards and you worry about how much heat you're generating. Uh, you got to get the heat out. You've got to make sure that you're not violating any uh, of the heat requirements, et cetera, and space and bending radius requirements. There are a lot of little things you've got to think about in that motor control center, even the bucket. So taking a bucket out and taking everything out of the bucket and say, I'm going to put this other stuff in there. That's still a no, no. Um, so, that's that's an that was a good I don't know if I covered that to justice but I know uh, a few of our guys down in our motor control center group they just cringe when they see some of the things that are being advertised as what they can do uh, some companies can do it's just amazing all right uh, so I did that uh, this is in regard to recondition equipment other words from retrofit now you can rec you know rec you can recondition low voltage motor control centers you can recondition the buckets you're gonna get uh, you're gonna want to get uh, you got to remove the labels. And the buckets will all have individual labels as well. Um, and, and my suggestion would be, there's no, I don't know if there's, I don't believe, I'd have to check uh, that section to see if there's a requirement that motor control centers have to be listed, right? There may not be a requirement that they have to be listed, but an inspector could come in to look at what you've done if you've pulled a, you know, again, you know, you gotta understand who the AHJ is. The AHJ may be the plant manager. The AHJ may be, um, uh, maybe a um, a state official or whatnot, uh, but whoever's going to look at that, they've got to say, how am I going to prove this? What is my basis for approval of this, what you've done? And uh, that's when a third-party review would be very handy. And I know UL and other organizations like UL do that same, do that type of work. Uh, it sounds as though you could replace a panel board inside a load center with iffy bus, iffy bus. And it might be replacing one for one, or it might be reconditioning, but not the panel board, board per se. All right. So here is an important thing. When you say panel board, you're not talking about the stuff inside and the enclosure. Okay. This is, I've gone back and forth with, uh, with, with Palmer Hickman out at, uh, at the electrical training lines, because he had a really good point. And, 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 I, and I think that there's some issues in the National Electrical Code. In the NEC, I've been searching on panel board. A panel board is that thing that's inside. It doesn't have the breakers. It has the bus. It's got the plastic. It's got the, uh, the, the lugs and terminals and terminations and things like that. The enclosure is listed to a different standard. So you have the enclosure and you have the stuff that's inside, the stuff that's inside, that's the panel board. So when I say panel board, I'm not talking about the breakers and the bus and the enclosure. That's not a panel board. That's an enclosed panel board, but it's not a panel board. When, when, and, and if you look at the National Electrical Code, you look at various areas, they just got it all wrong. They'll say that a conductor has to be in the panel board or it has to be landed in the panel board. And you, like, how do you go in the panel board? The panel board's a bus structure, right? Um, you, you could say in the enclosed panel board. So the terminology that we use in the National Electrical Code leads us to believe, and, and load center is not a term that's in there. So um, that, is a, uh, that is an area that uh, leads people to believe that that box that's on the wall is a panel board when it's really the stuff that's inside that is the panel board. So, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm in the process right now of go, trying to figure out by going through the NEC, looking at the use of the word panel board, and does it make sense? And in many cases, the language that's in the code and how they use the term panel board is not uh, Kovacevic. There's another word, look up Kovacevic. Uh, good question, John. Hope Tom get get TP address it. I don't know what that, John. I don't know if there's a question. Dave Shapiro. Um, jump to navigation. All right. Uh, agree to or uh, flood recovery. I've seen factory mutual rec recommendations on flood recovery, which I thought started the whole inclusion of reconditioning. Gabe Paletti, yeah, yeah, Gabe. Um, uh, the, the the actual what started the whole reconditioning discussion in the code, it came from Pearl, uh, the 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 organization that um, that does a lot of refurbishing, 
and I think I think it's more like you know it's just like listing listed products. You know, you say why would a manufacturer promote listed solutions as opposed to just self listing, right? What that does is it increases the safety in the industry. It gets everybody on the same uh, playing field so that if I have to do something, I want my competitors to have to do the same thing. I don't want them to start cutting corners and creating safety condition issues. And, and I'm trying to you know do the right thing. So the standards bring everybody up to the same playing field. And I believe that's why Pearl uh, was so aggressive in the National Electrical Code. I can't speak for them. Uh, but it would be interesting to to hear their perspective, and I know they've been they've been talking about uh, that, and they were the submitter uh, of the first in the seventeen code, uh, some of the first language that was around this topic. Uh, load center and panel board are the same. Uh, load center, you know, a residential load center is listed to the same uh, standard as a panel board. So when you say panel board, uh, you, we use the words load center. That's just like. Uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, miniature circuit breakers. Okay, uh, those th that term doesn't exist in a standard. It's still a multi case circuit breaker, whether it's a miniature breaker, uh, <laughs> whether it's a big breaker. It's still a multi case circuit breaker. Uh, Westinghouse DB twenty five circuit breaker. Uh, this does not recondition. The breaker is upgraded. Uh, I would say reconditioning and upgraded. Yeah, yeah. Wh whatever that word is. Remember the informational note on the definition. Uh, yeah, and the other thing that was used in this last cycle was the NEMA, um, uh, the NEMA information with regard to uh, reconditioning, refurbishing, and NEMA does have a good document on water damaged equipment. Um, so what I'll do is I will just uh, bring this over, and if you go to uh, Google or whatever your favorite NEMA water damage equipment there is an evaluating water damaged equipment from nema it's a free a free guide free download from their website um, that is evaluating water damaged electrical equipment um, it gives you some uh, some ideas and, and and guidelines on how to recognize and what you can and can't do with regard to uh, when you find equipment that has been water damaged, and that's something that goes across the country. I know our NEMA field reps share this information for all of those localities that have water damage. And this is one of the prompters that would that would say why you um, you would do this work uh, and recondition. Uh, so it tells you here, like the, they have a nice table, electrical distribution equipment, low voltage fuses, replace it. Multi key circuit breakers, replace it. Busway may be reconditioned, panel boards may be reconditioned, and they give you the guides and documents to help you give you guidance on, on what that means. So this is a, you know, NEMA provides some really good resources in and around this area of reconditioned and others as well. So uh, that's a, a reference for you for, uh, for your reading enjoyment. Keep a copy on your uh, nightstand, in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the car. I've always used a NEMA guide. My question, I guess, would have been that it's considered reconditioning. If you're taking that product that was water damaged and you're thinking that it's not working correctly and you take it apart, the moment you take it apart, you're reconditioning it, right? Because then, then it's probably broke. 98 in the house. Thank you, guys. Uh, what do you call a low voltage, low voltage power circuit breaker that is converted from air magnetic to, to, to vacuum interrupters, remanufactured or upgraded? Either way, You've met the definition, and you're probably and because in if you look at the uh, the the National Electrical Code tells us that uh, let's do that 240. Look at the NEC 240. It's a good good question, Mr. Crowshore. Um, here's the here's a key thing that any time if you I think it's 240.88. I don't want to get anybody dizzy. Don't look at the screen while I scroll. Um, 240, 87, 80, Yep. Now look what this language says. Reconditioned equipment shall be listed as reconditioned and the original listing mark removed. So this is the only place in the NEC around reconditioned equipment where it says that if you recondition that breaker, it's got to be listed or whatever that product is. So panel 10 went as far as saying, look, 
If you're going to recondition a low or medium voltage, which you're permitted to, or a high voltage. So, Mr. Crosser, you know, if you take that low voltage power circuit breaker and you do whatever it is, that, that voodoo that you do so well to it, you're going to have to get a third party to list it as being reconditioned. And then they're going to look at the, what was uh, Johnny Cash's uh, Cadillac called? Man. Yeah, they're going to look at that, uh, that, that Cadillac that you just built. Uh, which is prized from all these different parts and pieces, and you just change it into something else, or uh, Eddie Van Halen's guitar, right? Uh, Strata Monster, or whatever he calls it. You know, they're going to have to list it as something. So whatever they list it as, that's what it's going to be called. So that's a well, very. The reason why I asked that question, Tom, was because that's a major portion of the business at Eaton is converting the old air magnetics to uh, the vacuum interrupters, and yeah. I was just wondering. From an Eaton standpoint, what what you guys do with it? That yeah. was really where I was aiming at. I uh, got you. Yeah, you know, and I'm not uh, I'm not as familiar with how they label that uh, product, so I don't know that I can accurately give you that. But I'll take that down. I'm gonna I'm gonna look through these and I'm gonna uh, assemble a lot of these questions that I I can't I don't know the answer to. That's well, that's well, that's a good one. I'll get our our guys uh, up in our engineering services. To give me the answer hey, to that one. Hey Tom, this is Gabe. Real quick to answer that question, though, Perfect. I don't think the medium voltage breakers are they're, they're, They don't really have a listing to that effect. They only, I think, they only have to abide by ANSI standards, and there is an ANSI standard related to converting air to vacuum. Ah, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. So the, the so that's governed by an ANSI standard, and um, and it's a and it's a process. So, and th and that could follow as a, as the listing. Thanks for for. Uh, for dropping in. Beautiful. See it? You saved me some work. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Awesome. Local 59 in the house, local 98. All right. I'm just looking down through here. Uh, even the code does not require listing equipment in general. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, I had, a, I had one of our senior leaders tell me, hey, what, what section in the code requires uh, circuit breakers to be listed? I had to I had to break the news that uh, circuit breakers aren't required to be listed outside of this 24088. If you recondition it, now you're required to be listed. Okay, OSHA does not require all electrical equipment in the workplace to be listed. That's true. All right, so we've got some examples. All right, so I think boy, this is really good dialogue. I'm appreciating it. Let's take a look on the web. I'm lost track of my uh, of my YouTubers. My tubers, where are they at? I'm gonna bring this over here and go to the live stream. All right, we got Bob Fahey out there listing of overcurrent protective device. I utilize NEC 110.2 and 110.3B during inspections. Uh, very unusual to find unlisted overcurrent protective devices. I agree with you, Bob. Uh, I've seen unlisted fuses uh, from other countries. Interesting. Uh, Mr. Abbasi, sorry, did you exclude OCPD from the panel boards? Uh, NEC definition includes automatic overcurrent protective device as part of the panel board assembly. See, that's a panel board assembly. Um, and we can look at that definition when we get back to the panel board stuff. One piece at a time, and it didn't cost me a dime. I knew somebody knew Johnny Cash's movie or song. All right, we're going to look at uh, ground fault circuit interrupters. We beat that horse to death. Here we go, and away we go. All right, GFCIs, uh, there was uh, an effort, a global effort across the uh, NEC last cycle during the comment phase to align 210.8b with uh, the later chapters in the NEC. And, and here's the other thing, and even if you're not in a, a residential world, you really got to keep an eye on what's going on in 210.8a because here's what's going on on panel two. We're recognizing that, and, and, and you know, we're sort of getting slapped across the face with it, but we're recognizing that when you say something is hazardous in, in a residential dwelling unit, the question presents itself, why isn't the same hazard in other than a dwelling unit? So if a crawl space is dangerous in one, why isn't a crawl space dangerous in another? So those discussions are going on, and you're going to see some things that are in 210.8a migrate over to B, not because we had a body count, but because someone asked the question, why isn't it a hazard over there? 
uh, expansion due to recognized hazards. And that's uh, sort of uh, what you're seeing in, in, the, in the last one. So let's take a look at 210.8 first. Um, 210.8 GFCIs, um, and this is, you know, so what you're seeing here is A through F. There's an, uh, there's a, we moved boat hoists. Boat hoists didn't get deleted that you no longer have to require GFCI for boat hoists. We just, that was covered back in 555 for marinas, so we didn't have to put it here again. Uh, D is specific appliances. Uh, we made some changes there, equipment requiring servicing and then outdoor outlets. So, And we did some expansion in dwelling units. So what we did in dwelling units basically, um, so they, they, they the, the question was arised, you know, we had, remember, only 15 and 20 amp circuits. Then we moved that to, uh, uh, we moved the other than dwelling units to uh, up to 50 amp and single phase and 100 amp three phase. Well, we asked the question in uh, dwelling units, and we said, you know what? We don't care what amp rating receptacle it is. If it's in any one of those locations, it's going to need to be GFCI protected. And I think that's a significant uh, increase in coverage. And it, it takes you above the 15 and 20 amp in dwelling units. We'll cover that a little bit more. Uh, made minor modifications in um, in in A. Uh, basically aligning with what was going on in A. That's sort of what we did in B. So we're just doing some minor modifications uh, there. We moved that to Article 555, uh, which is specifically 555.9. Uh, we're You're seeing a struggle between uh, appliances. Oh, boy, I know what I forgot. And I'm surprised nobody said anything. Um, I'm going to do this right after after this slide. Specific appliances, um, uh, continuing that journey of alignment with Article 422, and <laughs> man, uh, and uh, requiring uh, uh, service equipment requiring servicing. We'll talk about that one too. And then outdoor outlets. You, I, I tell you what, I'm upset. I'm upset at every one of you on the phone, and or I keep saying phone. Um, you let me forget something. You let me forget all about the quiz. So this was day three. We had 203 respondents. The first question, since we're in GFCIs, this is what sparked my, uh, no pun intended, My, I was like, oh, crap, I forgot all about this. If I touch an energized conductor that is protected by a GFCI, no more than 6 milliamps will flow through my body. 78 said true, 120 said false, and 5 said I don't know. 204 respondents. Well, let me tell you. If you touch a circuit, and remember, the, the, the flow of current through your body is dependent upon the resistance of the circuit and the resistance of your body. If I did the math, and I said I knew what your resistance was, and I knew what the impedance of the system was, and I said if you touch that conductor, you're going to have 5 amps flowing through your body, even if you're on a GFCI, five amps is going to flow through your body. All right? Um, and that's an important fact because what's going to happen is the GFCI is going to trip very fast, but GFCIs don't, don't, aren't current limiting type devices where they're going to reduce the RMS current that's flowing. Okay? Uh, you're still going to see five amps, but you're not going to see it long enough that your heart's going to go into defibrillation. We went into those to that detail on GFCIs last week. I believe it was on Wednesday, one week ago today. The GFCI requirements in 210.8 only address receptacle outlets. 65 say true, 131 say false. 16, what's that? 210.8? I love you. Glad you're here. Um, well, the 135 that are that say uh, false, they are right because... Uh, we're going to talk about some of the GFCI requirements that are on outlets. And that's a part of one part of the expansion this year, this cycle, but uh, not on the other. So uh, GFCI requirements in 210.8 do not just, recept uh, not just address receptacle outlets. They do address, um, <laughs> nobody said uh, anything about 100% because you thought, you, you thought everybody got 100%. Well, Mr. Neitzel, 
I think what we're showing now is there is a definite need to educate here. Um, but look at this. Everybody's piling on now, and they're all jumping on the false bandwagon. That's okay. You 68, we still love you, and that's what we're here for. All GFCI requirements are found in 210.8. I'm glad that looks like uh, a majority of you know that uh, there are GFCI requirements in the later chapters as well. So, And we're going to talk about that alignment. So uh, those 20 that weren't sure, you will now know that there are GFCI requirements. You have to look throughout the code uh, and look at the equipment that you're working on or the, the application that you're in to understand the requirements. I must always have a hardwired light switch to control lighting. These new fangled wireless things are not permitted. Um, that would be false because, and we're going to talk about that today, that those new fangled wireless things, you are permitted now in the 2020 version code to use those, not in the older versions of the code. Uh, in the older versions of the code, you have to have this light switch. You've got to pull that wire down to the light switch because of the way the language was written, but not today. So... The NEC prohibits me from laying a panel board on its back. This is never permitted. 120 true, 98 false. <clears throat> well, I would say that if you are on the 17 code or anything earlier, you are permitted to put that panel board on its back. There's nothing in the code that says you cannot. And that is why the code changed during the 2020 cycle. So you... um. You can't, um, you can't, as we're going to look in the requirements in 408, as part of the 2020 code, uh, you cannot uh, put a panel board on its back anymore. And that may or may not cause you an issue depending upon uh, what you're doing. But uh, what drove that are those laundry mats that have uh, those panel boards built in. They're laid on their back and there's safety concerns around that. So 134 of you now were not correct, but the 103 of you were Good job, because you are permitted, not per the 2020 code. That's probably what the those. Uh, that's probably what these. I'll give the 136 were saying. Well, we were thinking about the 2020 code. That's okay. Still love you. Fuse short circuit current ratings are always higher than circuit breaker short circuit current ratings. 164 said false, 50 true. And the key here is fuses and circuit breakers do not have short circuit current ratings. They have interrupting ratings. Fuses and circuit breakers stop the flow of current. They do not hold together. I mean, and now you can you can argue there's some withstand ratings on these big boys, the big power breakers, but um, uh, circuit breakers and fuses have interrupting ratings. You've got to tune in tomorrow for our circuit breaker basics. Now look at this. You guys are almost split. A dishwasher that is cord and plug connected will always have to be plugged into a GFCI receptacle in the kitchen. That may or may not be true because it depends on where that receptacle is. If the receptacle is within six feet of the sink, I would say yes. But if it's not, because of 422, 422 puts some rules in that tells us that, hey, I could put it in the cord if I wanted to. I don't necessarily need to have a GFCI receptacle. Remember, I don't have to, I could, the only thing governing it in the kitchen is uh, whether or not it's within six foot of the sink. Um, but if I am following 422, 422 dot, 422, do, 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 do. what is 422? And a day, and a glare. Anyway, I've got the, I don't have that section memorized in my head but um i know it's up there early for ground fault circuit interrupters they gave us options which you may i you know i have heartburn with it personally so i don't want to get on my um i don't want to get on my my soapbox yeah 422.5 geez i'm in you know when you're looking for something at the beginning of an article, don't start at the end of the article. Jeez, oh man. 422.5, ground fault circuit interrupters uh, for personnel. Remember, 422 is on appliances, and 422 has um, dishwashers in it, and it tells us that you can put it within the brand circuit overcurrent device. You can put a device or outlet within the supply circuit. You can have an integral part of the attachment plug. 
You can have it within the supply cord, not more than 12 inches from the attachment plug, or you can have it factory installed with the appliance if they make it that way. So, no, we don't necessarily always have to have it plugged into a GFCI receptacle. I'd love to see uh, some people arguing about that one. The NAC prohibits you from locking a switch in the on position. This is a good one. Um, there is now a requirement. There, there wasn't anything before. Uh, so the NEC uh, didn't have any specific language. They'll always say, shall be able to be locked in the off position. But they don't say, shall only be able to be locked in the off position. So that didn't prohibit you from locking it in the on position. But the 2020 code made a change for elevators, and we're going to talk about that in the, uh, hopefully today, where you uh, are not permitted to have that switch able to be locked in the on position. So we're going to review that change. But that was a good one. The NEC requires you in some applications to know the relationship of occupants to determine the rules. I love this one. And you know what I'm going to do for all of you? Here is what I'm going to do. Because I love you so much, I'm going to show you the code. Well, I just showed you my OBS Studio. Okay. Here's what we're dealing with. We're going to go to Article 100. And we are going to look at the definition. <laughs> there are some of you on the phone going, oh my gosh, I know exactly where he's going. We're going to look at the definition of dormitory. So we come down here to the these, and we look for dormitory unit. It is a new definition. A building or a space in a building in which group sleeping accommodations are provided for more than 16 persons who are not members of the same family in one room or a series of closely associated rooms under joint occupancy and single management, with or without meals, but without individual cooking facilities. So, I hear that the uh, that virus testing unit will also do a geno geo geology or genealogy uh, test um, to, to figure out whether or not the members are going to be of the same family. So let me tell you how this one came about. Um, we have requirements for uh, certain requirements for arc fault circuit interrupters in uh, these dormitories. Uh, expansion in 210.12. We'll take a look at that. And remember what we said. Anytime you have a new requirement, GFCIs, we're big on this. AFCIs too, a little bit. The moment you say, you know, if you have a dormitory unit, it has to have DFCI protection. What's a dormitory unit? I don't know what that is anymore. So we stole this definition actually from the... Uh, I believe it was the construction code or the building code. And that's the way they had it, and that's the way we used it. Uh, but we did tweak it a little bit. I can't remember what we did, uh, because if it was a, a direct pull, we'd have to say what it was. But um, I can't remember the, the actual changes that we did to this and tweaked it. But um, So the answer to that one question, the NEC requires you in some applications to know the relationship of occupants to determine the rules. I would say these 124 are true. That's the way it is. I'm not Paul Harvey on this one. When I take these online NEC 2020 code changing classes, I am in my in my home office. Some oh, 36 of you are at work, 19 in the living room, nine in my kitchen, 22 in the dining room, and 19 other, but the majority of us are in our home office. I love it. And then I think the last one was what country? Let's take a look. God's country. West Virginia, obviously. Saskatoon. That's my buddy Nihad. Costa Rica. Pandemia. Dogs. <laughs> America. Canada. Pandemia. Republic of Texas. Oh, you Texans. Uh, United States. Canada. God's country. So India. Thank you for joining from India. Excellent. Costa Rica, thank you for joining. So Guatemala, thank you very much. Awesome. So this is a great show of, uh, of the power of the web and um, what we can do even when we are uh, stuck in the house.
So we got a lot of good, good, uh, a lot of places uh, covered. Thank you very much. This is good stuff. All righty. So, and uh, I will hold it against everybody that you didn't remind me to go through the quiz first. Man. Okay. Examples of electrocutions and recognition. So the expansion over the last two cycles, I agree, has been significant. But unfortunately, expansion in 210.8 means we have, in most cases, body counts. Uh, the hazard, we realized that the hazard didn't change just because the circuit got greater than 20 amps. Uh, and then again, there's a struggle between dwelling units and other than dwelling units to try to keep them aligned. We're starting to get uh, public input saying, hey, guys, uh, what are you what are you smoking there? Because, uh, you know, if it's a hazard there, it should be a hazard here. Um, I'm not going to, that is a, this is to learn more about GFCI. That's a whole separate class. Uh, let's take a quick look at dwelling units. We increased, we took out the 15 and 20 ampere. So we said any 125 volt or 250 volt receptacles installed in any of those locations, one through 11 within the National Electrical Code, have to have GFCI protected. I don't care if it's a 30 amp, a 60 amp, a 50 amp. We didn't put an amp value on it. It's in those rooms. So uh, again, the, uh, you have to understand what a receptacle is, uh, whether it's a single receptacle or a multiple sub receptacle. We made some changes in Article 100 on this, not we, but Code Making Panel 18. They added some clarity, I think. Uh, a lot of people have a hard time understanding what a receptacle is, especially when it says a single receptacle or, or you know, whether it's a duplex, you know, this is two receptacles. It's a duplex. Uh, we call it a receptacle. You know, no one says, hey, go get me those two receptacles connected to the same yoke. Uh, they say, go get me a receptacle, and this is what we bring. Um, so, But in reality, those are two receptacles. That's a shock to some, probably. Um, removal of the language, uh, again, expands GFCI protection. Uh, and then this was just a cleanup of the you know, changing to say and supplied by single phase branch circuits rated 150 volts or less to ground. So that's just a cleanup of the language. Uh, this was some of the substantiation we we received. A 10 year old girl was looking for her kittens behind the dryer and she was electrocuted. Um, her father noted that uh, when they tried to move the dryer, he, he was shocked. But again, you know, I think it's probably a lot. It's not just an adrenaline. It's probably he had thicker skin and all this other good stuff. And she was probably in a compromising place where she couldn't get out of, um, unfortunately. Uh, then we had a child in Oklahoma trying to retrieve a stuck puppy behind a clothes dryer and came in contact with an exposed conductor. You know, those when you got behind a dryer and I had this happen in my house uh, in my um, uh, we were working in the. Uh, moving some things around and I moved the dryer out and the, the cord that was connected to the dryer, because it's so you have air circulation and things like that. And it's a warmer area. The, the connecting cord just, it just fell apart. Basically it just came, it just fell apart. Uh, this, the other one was a 10 year old child in uh, Houston, Texas. that was electrocuted while playing a game of hide and seek. He went into the dryer and was electrocuted in, inside the dryer. So unfortunately, you know, a lot of people will complain. They'll say, boy, you know, you're, you're, you're making big moves in uh, GFCI and, and whatnot. But, you know, when you're sitting at the table and you have to make a vote, it's hard to say no when you have, uh, when you have these types of stories that come about. And I, in my opinion, there's no reason why anybody should die in, uh, in a res especially a residential home. Um, uh, the other thing we did, and now here's a, <laughs> here is an issue that we have, which we have to clean up. I'm, I, I don't know if I don't, I don't know if anybody I don't know if uh, Ryan you've picked this up yet or or Don Ganier if you've picked this issue up but this is definitely an issue that little word and this is so funny that uh, how one word could really screw things up we should have put or I mean indoor damp and wet locations I mean if it's a wet location it's probably damp too <laughs> at some point uh, but if it's just a damp location it's probably not going to be a wet location. So um, that should be indoor damp or wet locations. I have a public input already in to try to fix that one. You got to love that. Uh, that's a bathroom. That's pretty. <laughs> anyway, uh, oh, we made this huge change. We spent hours talking about this one. We replaced basin with paren sink with sink paren basin. Yep. 
at least an hour talking about that one. Uh, garages, uh, also accessory buildings. I don't. This didn't change. Uh, in uh, we have the definition to help you understand what a garage is, or there's GFCI requirements there. I don't believe that changed in uh, the 20 version at all. Uh, again, um, uh, we, we are. I think we. I don't know. No, we're not talking. We're not going to talk about that. That that was 17. This is all 17 stuff. Sorry about that. Crawl spaces are below grade. Uh, that was added in 1990, and and. and Again, just to prove to you that that most of the requirements in in two ten point eight are driven around uh, shock, and here are the numbers that was uh, entered in nineteen ninety sixteen fatalities due to faults on portable cords, work lights, extension cords, crawl space fat uh, fatalities accounted for sixty one percent of the basement or crawl space selected cases. So there are statistics around some of these, and what we did in the twenty cycle, we got rid of the word unfinished. Now you think about it. Uh, you know, my perception of what is finished may be different than someone else's perception of what's finished. You know, for me, you throw a carpet on the ground, put a chair in that room, throw a TV on the wall in my basement. That's a finished basement. I love that rough look. Uh, for someone else, they may say, that's just a carpet on the ground, a chair in that room, and a TV on a wall. It's not finished. Um, or, you know, uh, if I was the inspector, I'd probably tell you, hey, that's a finished basement. So, we got rid of the ambiguity and we just removed the word unfinished and said any basement needs to have GFCI. Again, uh, uh, recent additions, we focused on uh, unfinished areas and whatnot. So you, know, you have moisture down here. You've got cement surfaces, conductive surfaces. You have a lot of opportunity to ground yourself. So uh, it, it just presented a hazard and we said we're going to get rid of the argument. All basements. All right, kitchens, a kitchen, an area with a, uh, it's important. I'm going to bring this definition up again, but a, an area with a sink and permanent provision for food preparation and cooking. I'm going to bring this up again, but that definition, uh, we did some expansion in 210.8B uh, that will hit some other areas, and we just changed one word in there, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain that to you when we get there. So uh, I was uh, in, in one of the houses that I, my la the last house I sold, no, the second to last house I sold, I had an electrical inspector who uh, flagged it. My wife called me, she said the, uh, not electrical inspector, house inspector, home inspector said that we, we didn't have any GFCI receptacles in our kitchen. And I said, well, I, I had GFCI at the, at the breaker, so I don't need them there. And he argued with me, said they had to be GFCI receptacles. Uh, they're not required to be a GFCI receptacle. I mean, you can put them in there for local reset. Great idea. I have put mine in the basement inside my panel board. Sinks have changed over years. I mean, that's, you know, sinks have gotten real uh, real funky, so we've had to change the, the language in the code. Uh, we went from, in the 11, sinks located in areas other than kitchens. In 14, we just said uh, all sinks, doesn't matter where it's at. And in 17, we got into changing the measurements. And when we did that, uh, we also impacted uh, the behind-the-door issue. Um, but sinks have changed, and uh, how you measure from a sink is important. You know, I don't know if that was a bike I was supposed to ride it and drink, or if that was a sink, but that's a sink in a bathroom I was in down in, uh, in uh, I think it was in St. Louis. Uh, boat houses, eight, 1987 added boat houses to 210.8 because there's a common work is being done in boat houses. Um, and then uh, nine was bathtubs or shower stalls, so... This was, uh, again, not. A, this was a 14 change. I, I just want to hit the, here's a 17 change. You know, this was the earth-shattering thing we did. Uh, we, we replaced the basin sink to sink basin. That's all the time I'm going to spend on that one. So how about um, uh, in, in the 14, we added receptacles and laundry areas, and that's when we had to have a definition of what a laundry area was. Right? So the moment you put a, a requirement in, then... Um, you know, we need a definition of it, and we added that definition in the 17 code uh, to answer the, in, the those who tried to get out of putting GFCIs in. So in um, in, the, in this one here again, that's got to be damp or wet locations. Um, so, but we uh, we again we were just trying to encompass those areas like dog washing stations and whatnot. And we had a a 210.8 B6 that had the same title, and somebody asked the question. You know, you're doing it in B, why aren't you doing it in A? And uh, they made a good point. They said, if it's a hazard over there, it's a hazard over here. And they, they brought up the whole uh, the whole uh, dog washing station aspect. And that's true. It was true. 
You have to understand what a damp location is, you know, protected from weather, not subject to saturation with water or other liquids. And then you have a dry location. Again, it's uh, not normally subject to dampness or wetness. And then you have to know what a wet location is, uh, underground or in concrete slabs, etc., cetera, uh, with, within the earth, in locations subject to saturation by water, outside all the unprotected areas, right? So you've got to protect the poochies. Uh, if you have a house and this is your, I think this, uh, this is Don Gunnear's house, right? Don, you sent this picture to me. Uh, these, uh, these, if you have a house big enough that you have this type of a washing station in it, then, um, or, you know, even in other than dwelling units, I guess you, you'll still have these types of scenarios. Uh, there may not be a sink in there. There may, there may not be a basin, et cetera. Um, but, uh, you know, if you meet the, if it's a wet location, you're going to need GFCI protection. I think the biggest thing in A was all receptacles in um, in those locations. That was the big one. Other than dwelling units, the 210.8B did not exist before NEC 1993. Uh, and what they did before 1993 was they put the requirements uh, back out there in uh, chapters five, six, and seven. So. Uh, before the 90, and, and in that time frame, you think about it, back in, at least before the 2017 code, we only had GFCI protection on 15 and 20 amp circuits. So there was no problem and no conflict between A or between 210.8B when it entered into the code and those other areas in the NEC. Now, in my, my opinion, what they should have done back then, back in 1993, they should have had a, a task group put together and they should have said, look, we have requirements in 210.8B. We have requirements in other than dwelling units. Let's get all of these in one location. I am in the ballpark of the people who believe that you should probably have everything in one area when it comes to GFCI. When you pepper it all over the place, it's a good chance it's going to get missed. A lot of people reference 210.8 as the requirement, but that's not the case. They're peppered throughout the NEC, and that created a challenge, uh, a correlation issue once the 17 uh, version of the code hit the hit the books. So uh, you have all 125 volt through 250 volt receptacles uh, supplied. So we cleaned up some of the language uh, because um, we had some issues with uh, some of the language with the way we, we wrote it with regard to whether or not the, re the receptacle had to have that rating or if it's the, the circuit. Uh, so we cleared that up uh, and uh, we didn't change the 50 amps or 100 amps in this cycle so you still have that from the 17 cycle so if you didn't know about it uh in uh, the 17 uh code book we expanded gfci in other than dwelling units to include up to 50 amps single phase and 100 amps three phase um, simply cleaned up the language again that was all we did there I already said to that um i'm going to quickly walk through some of the history because uh, you know what i did was i went back to the 93 code and said hey where did we bring these things in? Uh, it started in bathrooms. It went to rooftops. It went to kitchens. It then went to outdoors and public spaces. They said commercial and institutional kitchens. They wanted to be clear um, for some reason. Then they went back to kitchens again in the 2008 version, got rid of the commercial stuff and went to the outdoors and sinks. And then the 11, they added indoor wet locations and locker rooms. I remember those the presentations we used to do at the IEI stuff on uh, locker rooms and then garages. Um, and then uh, the 14 added an exception for the rooftops, but they didn't add any more locations uh, because remember, GFCIs have to be readily accessible. Um, and, and then they gave an, a, 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 I guess you call it an exception for, for exhibition halls. Um, and uh, then they added in the 17 cycle crawl spaces and unfinished basements and that's what prompted the discussion, some of the discussions over uh, this cycle with the 2020 code with regard to crawl spaces and uh, unfinished basements, or now we just say basements. So this is where we're at right now in the 2020 cycle. We, um, <clears throat> we expanded, made some changes in kitchens. Uh, we expanded to more areas that will impact where you have food preparation. So this will be important for those uh, industrials out there where you have maybe, uh, if you're uh, modifying or you're doing things where you have uh, break rooms and whatnot. Um, so that'll, that'll uh, hit you uh, there. We're going to have a slide on that one. 
Oh, and then we have the we have the damp and wet locations. We messed that up again there too. So here's what we did for kitchens. We said kitchens or areas with a sink and permanent provision, permanent provisions for either food preparation or cooking. Now remember the definition of kitchen is an area with a sink and now just just follow me uh, for areas after areas. I want I want you to follow my language while you wa look at the language that's on the screen. An area with a sink and permanent provisions for food preparation and cooking. So what I just read was the definition of a kitchen, which almost looks identical to what's in two. So after the fact, I was reading this after the fact, I got a phone call and they said, you guys really screwed up uh, 210.8B2. And they said, look, you said kitchens or kitchens. And I read it and I'm like, well, wait a second. Or areas with a sink and permanent provisions for either food preparation and cooking. I'm like, well, that is the definition of a kitchen. So it looked like we said kitchens or kitchens. But we changed one word, and the one word we changed was, instead of saying food preparation and cooking, we said food preparation or cooking. That makes just one word in the National Electrical Code makes a big difference. So this is the definition that I was reading to you while you looked at the other. There's that key word, and, right there, and which is now or. So if I look at a kitchen, I have a sink and I have permanent provisions for cooking. That is a kitchen. This is a kitchen because it has a permanent provision for cooking and a sink. This break room is not a kitchen. It has a sink, but there are no permanent provisions for cooking. And the big debate in these areas would be, well, you know, I, uh, what if I throw a microwave on the desk there? Is that a permanent provision? no, it's a cord and plug type of thing. Uh, I've had some inspectors say, well, if you physically mount that microwave and plug it in, I'm going to call that permanent provisions for cooking, and you're going to call that a kitchen, and now you're going to have to have GSCI protection. So, and I know that's a debated uh, item in the industry as well. So, uh, but it's in, th this is important how a definition can, uh, and, and what this, understanding the definition. So we have to understand what a kitchen is to understand the impact of that change. Uh, and, and I pointed out to you already, it's either food preparation or cooking, not and cooking, right? So now this break room, I have a sink and I have a food preparation area. So I have a sink and I have for either food preparation or cooking. So I have one or the other. It's this requirement is going to impact all of those locations like your Starbucks, your Dunky Donuts, uh, uh, your break rooms and things of that nature. Uh, those areas are going to be impacted are now going to have GFCI protection because and the argument was made. Uh, I think it was an electrical inspector who brought it up. Uh, I, I, um, oh, man, I can't. He's out of Denver, Colorado. His name escapes me right now. It will pop in my head. But he said, you know, uh, you're looking at these areas that. Uh, They've got they've got the whole mixture. They've got electrical stuff. They've got uh, electrical appliances. There's no GFCIs installed because there's no GFCI requirements. But uh, it is an area where they're doing food prep. Maybe it's fish or, or coffee pots, and they're dealing with liquids and all these other different things. The hazards are still there. So that's that was I think a, a significant change. I'm not going to go through the 14 changes. Let's talk about this again. There's the damp and wet locations opportunity. Uh, for change. That's what we like to do. We don't want to be perfect. You don't want to be perfect. You want to have opportunities for improvement, right? That's the way I look at it. Uh, added uh, accessory buildings to the garages. So accessory buildings with electric uh, are not too much different than garages and similar hazards are present. Uh, that was the argument that was made and the code making panel agreed with that person. So we have um, accessory buildings. So we have garages and then we have added, whoop, sorry about that. We have added the accessory buildings right there uh, and uh, service bays and, and whatnot. So there's your laundry areas that was new. And there's your bathtubs and shower stalls where receptacles are installed within six foot of the outside edge of the bathtub or shower stall. So we made some changes there as well. We added that accessory buildings to align with 210.8A. Again, that's one of those you say, 
you're doing it over there. Why aren't you doing it over here? And we added this uh, expanded to laundry areas. And I think that's probably going to be a little bit of a significant change as well. Um, so keep your eyes on that. Uh, what else? All right, laundry areas, uh, alignment with 210.8a. The hazards are the same regardless, again. Oh, there's your, uh, there's your, whoops, there's your laundry area. Okay, and you gotta, you gotta be mindful that those receptacles are all gonna have to have GFCI protection. Then you have your bathtubs or shower stalls, or bathtubs and shower stalls. So what we did there was we added some new areas for bathtubs and shower stalls. We aligned that with 210.8a. Again, you're seeing, you know, and, and I, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm curious to see if we ever get rid of A and B. Uh, you know, I'd love to know what other people's opinions are on that. But at some point, when does it make sense to just say you have a 210.8 um, and you don't have all of these different uh, A's and B's and whatnot? All right, so the hazard doesn't change, so we expanded that to bathtubs and shower stalls. Uh, crawl spaces, lighting outlets, uh, that is, uh, again, this is where you have an outlet. It's not a receptacle. It's an actual outlet that's required to have GFCI protection. So it was introduced in the 17 code, uh, and that was, again, uh, driven uh, from uh, a death of an electrical worker or a worker who was in a crawl space, backed up against a light bulb, and unfortunately uh, was electrocuted. Now, we don't have a definition of crawl space, and somebody tried to make a definition of a crawl space. They said uh, an area with a height of less than six and a half foot that is designed to allow human entry. I don't know how you determine whether or not it's human entry or some elephant entry or something like that. I don't know. But in any case, um, that was their justification, and uh, that was the public input. And the panel resolved that, saying that we didn't see a need to define a crawl space uh, other than what was in Webster Dictionary. Remember, we mentioned that earlier, that the Webster Merriam is, uh, is our resource. And to see the Manual of Style and 312, that's your reference. And then, uh, again, <clears throat> uh, the height was too restrictive. And so that was, uh, if you look at Merriam-Webster, it's a shallow, unfinished space beneath the first floor or under the roof of a building, especially for access to plumbing or wiring. So. If the definition is not in the NEC, you go back to Merriam-Webster or the building code. All right, um, 210.8D, we added uh, specific appliances. So now what we did here, uh, we recognized that back in, um, well, no, this now actually, this is just an alignment. We tried to come up with language to align with what uh, they did in 422. You know, I'm not going to get on my bandwagon. I don't like what they did in 422. But that's the way it is. I voiced my opinion at the code panel, and I lost. Uh, changes to align with 422 will we'll focus on appliances. And again, what drove a lot of the changes in 422 is right there. So remember, GFCIs have to be uh, readily accessible, and there's a requirement for the sodi pop machines or the appliances. And you take that machine, and you put the receptacle behind it, and you have the GFCI in the cord. And when you push that machine behind it, now you have no um, access to reset and test that GFCI product. So that sort of drove a lot of the changes that we're seeing in 422. Um, and the fact, because you know that has to be readily accessible based on what's in 210.8 and, uh, <clears throat> and, and the definition is you can't move things. Um, so, you know, again, um, that, uh, that's what made some changes there. So just be mindful of what's going on in 422 as well. Equipment requiring servicing. So this is another important change for the electrical worker who is, look, working on equipment that might be in a location that's not in an area where you don't have already have GFCIs. So, for example, if I have HVAC equipment and, and my HVAC equipment's in my basement, my basement needs to have GFCI protection on all my receptacles. So I'm covered. If I have that HVAC, or if I have equipment that's outside and, I, and I'm required to put a receptacle for servicing, if it's outside, it already has to have GFCI protection, it will need to be GFCI protected. Um, and it will be. But there are places where you have equipment that requires servicing that may not have GFCI requirements. If you have a receptacle there for, the, for, for that purpose of maintenance, it's going to now need to be uh, GFCI protected. 
210.63 got a significant amount of changes as well. We reordered it and restructured it a little bit. Uh, we're going to take a look at that uh, at some point here during our journey through the NEC changes. So this is another, this is a case where you have uh, HVAC in the attic. Now, you know, somebody could call this a, if it's not considered a crawl space, it wouldn't be uh, GFCI. Uh, if it's an attic with a taller roof and you don't consider it a crawl space, then that would not need to be GFCI protected. But based upon this recent change, that will have to be GFCI protected. And there could be cases where you have equipment in a, any type of facility. This is not just dwelling unit, other dwelling unit. This is, uh, you know, this is around uh, uh, anything that you're putting a receptacle in for maintenance purposes, GFCI protected. And test it before use, please. Now, this is a, a considerable change. Outdoor outlets, all outdoor outlets for dwellings other than those covered in A3, uh, exception to three, that are supplied by a single phase branch circuit rated 150 volts to ground or less, 50 amps or less, shall have ground fault protection. The key here is now there is an exception for lighting outlets, so you don't have to worry about the lighting outlets, uh, but you have, uh, uh, like, I, I remember we're talking about an outlet, so uh, the outlet uh, is, uh, is right over here where you put that little uh, disconnect uh, AC disconnect there, that is your outlet, and that's going to have to have GFCI protection regardless of the, uh, you know, again, 50 amps or less. Uh, and this applies, um, uh, it's, since it's not a 210.8A or, or B or, a, or whatnot, so this is uh, dwelling units, <coughs> and it's an outlet, not a receptacle. So that is considered an outlet. Uh, most GFCI requirements are around receptacle outlets, but this is an outlet outside of the lighting outlet. Remember the the crawl space lighting outlet, uh, there's a re there's a requirement there, uh, so that that would be a lighting outlet, and then what drove this is um, a case of a child who jumped over a fence, and uh, that unit that you're looking at right there was um, apparently not wired correctly, and uh, it was uh, the child. It would come, I think he was just trying to come back for curfew, and he touched that uh, HVAC unit, the condensing unit, and uh, he was killed. So um, things like that drive changes in the National Electrical Code. All right, I'm going to discard all my changes there. And we're going to take a look at, uh, a real quick look at GFCI for feeders. This was a change. Uh, ground fault circuit interrupter protection for personnel. And uh, if feeders are permitted to be protected by a ground fault circuit interrupter, again, what happened here, you think about the expansion of GFCI, uh, some people may th say, I want to provide the GFCI in a feeder instead of down at the branch circuit or at the receptacle. And uh, say you have a panel upstairs uh, and you just want to feed that whole sub panel with GFCI, you are permitted to do that. This gives you that permission. Um, and again, it correlates with what occurred uh, for the 15 amp and 20 amp receptacle outlets. Uh, again, it's, it's basically, you know, if I... Um, if I have, uh, if I place that, I could place the GFCI in that branch circuit for that boat hoist, or I could put that GFCI protection up there in the feeder. And the only thing you have to think about when the further up in this system, the further up in this system that you put G ground fault, the more you have to worry about leakage currents. And, and so, you know, four to six milliamps at this location may not be a good idea. Um, down here, probably not so much of a significant issue. You just got to think about all of these connected loads and any accumulated leakage currents uh, that may cause you some tripping issues. Right? Um, that would be the only thing that I would say uh, that you, uh, you know, again, you have like your bathrooms, your dishwasher, your kitchen. You can put your GFCI in that feeder circuit. So that was a, a quick little change. That was a nice little diversion. Um, I wanted to hit um, 555.35. Uh, this is your marina's uh, ground fault protection of equipment. I like what they did in this uh, in this article, probably because I was part of it. Um, I put this little note about Lucas Ritz. Please, 14 minutes of your life to hear his story. Uh, it's on my Facebook and LinkedIn site. It uh, it, may, it would mean a lot to me to uh, just share his story. Uh, but he passed away in a marina, uh, just swimming. 
Um, and uh, I'm not going to let you, you know, you can read that. Uh, my, my, my only message here is that the hazards are real in and around marinas. And when you look at what we did uh, in marinas, uh, you'll understand why we did what we did in marinas when it comes to ground fault protection of equipment and GFCIs. Uh, Michael Nudstead and his and, and was 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 killed and uh, we started this journey Joe Fellow and I uh, back in during the uh, 2011 cycle where we we tried to drive uh, GFCI and the main they said that wasn't going to work we came up with the idea to use 100 milliamps uh, that seems to have taken hold it's it's an instituted change in there uh, we institute because of those things that happened in the 11 cycle. Uh, that initiated a, a research foundation study that was put put into place. They recommended reducing that 100 milliamps down to 30 milliamps. Uh, that happened in the 17 cycle. That was a little bit uh, of a of a of an issue because 30 milliamps at the at the uh, service equipment presented a challenge. And and so in the 20 cycle, actually there was a TIA for the 17 cycle that pushed that back up to 100 milliamps and did a tiered uh, approach to ground fault protection in general, and this is uh, where we landed up. And I, I like what they did here, and I think this is a good model for maybe other areas or even outside of this area. Uh, we have a uh, 555.35A and B now. We have A, which talks about ground fault protection, receptacles providing shore power, GFCI protection for personnel, and then feeder and branch circuit conductors with ground fault protection of equipment. Uh, there is a big difference between GFPE and GFCI. Um, the, uh, the, the first one talks about receptacles that provide shore power. When anytime you use that word shore power, that's telling you that you're feeding a boat. Uh, shore power feeds a boat. Those are typically your 30 amp or, or higher uh, outlets, uh, receptacle outlets that are on pedestals. And you're required a 30 milliamp GFPE protection in those applications. And that 30 milliamp aligns with the um, BOAT ACBYA is the acronym American um, something, American Yacht, something Yacht and Boat uh, Association. I don't know what the, I can't remember what the C is. Uh, but in any case, uh, they have standards that you can list a boat to, and they put 30 milliamp GFPE protection at the main inside that boat. Uh, so we aligned. Uh, 555 with that for shore power. Uh, that's an example of shore power uh, from a, an inspection I was on with an inspector down in Alabama. Uh, that's I learned what dirt daubers are back in in that uh, in that experience. Uh, but that big, uh, nice big one, and you'll notice uh, there's some signage in there to tell you what is for shore power and what is not for shore power. And then what they did was they said. You have to have GFCI protection on all 15 and 20 amp receptacles for other than shore power. So you have you have 100 milliamps on the well we haven't talked about that yet, but you have 100 milliamps up to 100 on feeders going out to the to the uh, to the pier. You have 30 milliamps going to the boats, and you have 15 and 20 amp GFCI uh, life uh, you know people protection on anything that you're going to be plugging into. That would be a receptacle that's not for use as shore power. And you'll see, even on these pedestals, you'll see notes in there that say specifically not for use, uh, not for shore power. So that is a GFCI receptacle there that, uh, uh, but the other two will have to be, because those are for shore power, those will have to be protected by a circuit breaker either in that pedestal or somewhere upstream feeding that pedestal, and that will be ground fault protection of equipment, GFPE, 30 milliamps. And there's a good good shot of not shore power. And and those are the dirt daubers, the, the infamous dirt daubers. Yes, I didn't know if they bit or anything like that. I was just staying away from dirt daubers. Um, so, and then there's their feeder and branch circuit. So the feeder and branch circuit conductors uh, that are installed on docking facilities have to all be provided with GFPE not exceeding 100 milliamps. Uh, so so that, to me, I think, I love the tiered approach, 100 milliamps, 30 milliamps, it's four to six milliamps. You can argue that 100 milliamps is not going to save anybody. It's not going to save Lucas Ritz. It's not going to save any of those kids if they came in contact with things. But that 100 milliamps is probably going to detect leakage current well before they come in contact with anything. 
Uh, so those are just pictures of all the feeders that go out. And there are solutions. Uh, you got vendor has a relay. We have relays. Uh, Eden has relays. Uh, uh, I know we use a lot of the vendor products as well. And um, so those are solutions that are on the market to, 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 to serve that need. Uh, and again, and what they did was they said, where more than three receptacles uh, supply shore power to boats, you need to have this uh, leakage current measurement device. And, and this is because the complaint was, I have all these boats uh, in, in place, and I have one bad, one bad actor come in and plug in, and he takes the whole marina down. So what we're trying to do is instill an act of uh, getting these boats and marinas to say, have a station where you test that boat before they plug in, and then if they pass the test, you send them over to your electrified uh, uh, bay. If they don't pass the test, you tell them go over to that unelectrified um, uh, docking facility. Uh, so leakage current measurement device, again, and they, they have a description of what that in an informational note. An annual test of each boat with the leakage current measurement device is prudent step. Remember, informational notes cannot have requirements, but they can give you guidance, and this is where the head of this panel is at. They want to promote testing these boats because the reason Lucas, Lucas Ritz passed away and many others passed away is not necessarily because of the wiring on the infrastructure, but because of the boat that pulled into that dock and plugged in. That marina has a lot more than three shore power outlets, so that's going to have to have a leakage current measurement device. And uh, that was the, uh, the GFCI. I'm going to take a quick look at the chat. Uh, a switch isn't a, a switch isn't an outlet. Uh, the termination at the AC is Ryan Jackson. Well, if before I put that switch in, there is an outlet there. So the uh, that little disconnect is wired into a, an outlet. In my, in my opinion, I don't know. I could be a hundred percent wrong, and then you may be a hundred percent right uh, that the uh, the termination at the AC is. Uh, I just always looked at that uh, switch as an outlet because. Uh, before I install that switch, I'm going to have a I'm going to have an outlet there. But Ryan Jackson, you might be 100% right, buddy. I'm going to definitely ask a few people on that one. Uh, 150 volts or less. Normally, the condensing units are two pole. I agree. Uh, 120 volts, not line to line. Yep, yep, yep. Apparently, equipment maintenance is not a priority. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, but the cooktop or stove or receptacle should would be covered by 210.887. Uh, where receptacles are installed within six foot from the top edge of the sink. That is true, Mr. Gunnear. Uh, where the receptacles, uh, kitchens, where the receptacles, yep. So I'm just reading through some of the chats here. It's 153. I might be able to get through another section here too. Yep, so let's take a look at the uh, web uh, on our, our, what do you call it, our live stream, guys. Thanks for the clarification. 30, um, 30 milliamp breaker. We do have 30 milliamp breakers, GFPE. We do have that. Uh, we also have little separate little relays. American Boat and Yacht Council. It's A B Y C, not A Y C B, <laughs> whatever I said. Thank you, Mr. Jim Williams. Uh, added 2002 due to electrocution at a refrigerator. Was never intended to apply only to countertops. 210.8 B2. Yeah, you're probably right on that one, Ryan. Uh, is there a TIA to address 210 regarding installing to serve the countertop surfaces? All right. So it looks like we got some good dialogue going on out there. I'm going to see if I can, if there's something else I can hit uh, before we close. Um, I'm not going to hit uh, electrified truck. I'm not going to get to that. That was just, a, I'm not going to talk about the audio systems. A lot of those, the intent didn't change at all. They didn't change anything in those. 680 didn't change anything there, really. Something else I wanted to hit. I'm going to hit, uh, let me just take a look at Chapter 2 real quick. Might be a quick one we can hit before we break. Oh, identified. Let's look at this one. 210.5. Um, remember, we identify things and... and uh, uh, for for you know to provide the identification, I think I'm almost positive we changed this in the 20 cycle, uh, where you have uh, the 17 cycle. We talked about the durability of the label, and uh, they provided some new exceptions for existing installations. 
and, 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 and there's always confusion. Do you only have to mark the new system voltages at each termination? Uh, do you have to go back and modify and mark everything in that facility in the moment you start adding a new voltage into an, in, an installation? I think that was where we had some public inputs. And I know, Don Guneer, I think you were instrumental in some of this stuff. Uh, branch circuits supplied from more than one nominal voltage system. We did a change in 210.5C that talked about different systems within the in the same premises, uh, uh, different systems within the same premises that have uh, have the same voltage class shall be permitted to use the same identification. Uh, so we 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 added some language to help add some clarity there. We didn't want people to think that the moment you introduce a new voltage, you have to now label everything in that facility. So uh, that was the the thought process behind what we did from a panel two perspective. Um, and and there were some uh, issues with the use of the term system uh, and, and whether or not that was appropriate. Uh, we, we deemed that uh, it, it, it was appropriate uh, when you're in the same uh, facility that uh, it talks about multiple voltage systems may exist on that same premises, uh, but uh, you don't have to uh, identify every system uh, differently. And um, and this is sort of what we did. Uh, this was the 20 change or uh, and by system voltage class at all termination connections. So I think we still are struggling with 210.5. We're still seeing public inputs trying to add clarity to this because of the concern. Uh, at least what I'm perceiving is the concern to have to mark everything in that facility the moment you bring a different voltage uh, class into uh, into the structure into the uh, and into the picture. All right. I think the next, uh, the next, uh, our next session, we're going to get into uh, 210.11, 210.12 a little bit. There's not much in 210.12. We'll get into branch circuits required. Uh, we already did reconditioned equipment. We uh, ident we already did identification. A conductor opacity. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, let's see what else? Meeting rooms. We had to, we didn't really change much intent there. We did make some clarifications. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about 270, 270. The other big one will be 220. I, I'm going to ask Larry Ayer, who's the coordinating committee chair, I'm going to ask him to speak the 220 lighting load calculations because a lot of the changes came from a task group that he was associated with uh, in the lighting load. So hopefully on Monday, we'll have uh, a, uh, Larry Ayer as a guest speaker to uh, help us understand what's happening on 220.12 and uh, 220.42. Uh, and if you guys have any questions in that, he's a really good person to help you answer that one. We already talked about 225.30. I'm just trying to see what will be next next time. Uh, we, we talked about the service equipment, talked about emergency disconnects. We talked about, uh, we'll talk a little bit about series ratings. That's always misapplied. We're going to hit series ratings. We're going to hit... Um, we already hit 24067. We already hit that. So series ratings will be on our agenda uh, next in chapter two. And we might we're gonna get into chapter four as well. There's some new marking requirements for short circuit uh, marking requirements in uh, 408, actually, in panel boards and switchboards. Uh, short circuit current ratings. You look, look at all the changes. There's a lot of good stuff that happened in 408 that will definitely impact your next project. So, um, I hope you guys are okay with where we got today. And if I got to throw another day on top, we'll throw another day. We'll get through it all. We'll get through uh, the back chapters as well. Um, I'm going to throw up the 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 code, and um, and hopefully I'm gonna. And as I throw up, uh, I'm gonna throw up this code. But I'm also going to take a look at some of the chat stuff and uh, see what we have. In the chats, and at the chats, there are houses that get rained into. <laughs> Tom, what is the definition of basement? Mr. Pavia, we, I've had this discussion. I've heard this discussion. I've watched this debate occur in IAEI meetings where I was given presentations. Uh, there is a definition in the building code. I don't know the definition. I don't have the building code reference off the top of my head, but 
but I know there is a definition. They are going by the building code. You've got to go to the right. ICC. And we have folks from lots of geographic regions represented today, and we're so glad you could all join okay, us. Okay, someone is talking. Attendees will have the opportunity Hold to Hold on, answer everybody. Questions. Someone is. Thank you for muting very much. Um, okay, will a receptacle for a cooktop oven require GFCI? I think that's... Uh, Yep. So, uh, man, Don Grenier is on top of things. If a receptacle is within six foot of the sink, it will. I'm telling you, this is what's awesome about having a guy like Don Grenier and uh, and and my buddy uh, Ryan Jackson and Jeff Fecto and all of these other guys. You've got you guys on the line are in the presence of some very smart individuals. So, uh, watch these chats. I'm going to try to take some of these and. Uh, and formulate after the fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to take some of these chats and make a Word document that I can post out and share with everybody on some Q&A, uh, really good gotchas. I'm getting better at learning how to save off the chats so I can I can work with them later. Uh, but I'll pull some of this stuff together uh, to share that with everybody. And I'll put that, again, I'll have, I leverage my LinkedIn and my YouTube and my Facebook to share stuff. The NEMA, the NEMA guide isn't law any more than 70B is an adoptable standard, but they represent best practices. And I wouldn't want to respond to a lawyer saying why you didn't follow their recommendations. I don't know what the discussion is going on in that chat session, but Mr. Shapiro uh, or Dr. Shapiro, I think it is. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, why do we call a low voltage power circuit breaker that is converted? Oh, what do you, what do you, oh, we already talked about that one. So, and uh, there's my local F59 guys. All right, so that's the same chat sessions. And I think we got, okay, we've got some Middle middle English ungood from Old English ungood equivalent to unnot plus good adjective popularized by its appearance in Newspeak, a fictional language coined in 1984. Damn. George Orwell it goes back to George Orwell. That is, and that's that's good. Ungood. All right. Other words from retrofit, retrofitable. All right. So we've got some good chats going on there. Let's take a look at uh, web. Uh, let's take a look at the YouTube. See how many people are hung in there. Two hundred forty-six. God, I love you. I love every one of you guys. This is awesome. Uh, Ryan Jackson. I live in Utah. Some people here use not members of the same family, rather loosely. Oh, man, Ryan. Um, lock circuit breakers for fire pumps, fire alarms, emergency lightings. Not sure what that is going on. What happens when they replace the dishwasher? That's the thing. Thomas Hunt. So I'm going to get on my soapbox because it's after, and you've got the quiz. Everybody's got the quiz stuff, so you can, you can just drop off when you want to. But I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit. So here's what's going on between 422 and 210.8. I have a fundamental disagreement with some people that I very much respect in the industry. 422 is on appliances. And if you think about what drove, what does appliance, the requirements in appliances do, they drive a lot of the standard requirements around appliances. They tell us how we're supposed to apply and, and, and worry about appliances. Appliances are movable items. Appliances are if I think about my my wash my, the pictures of uh, in this program of uh, the laundry or my uh, my um, my uh, clothes washer and dryer and you know what I've had those in three homes so far we move those from house to house to house with us because my wife loves that washer and dryer so uh, that's an appliance and <clears throat> when I take those to a new home. I'm going to plug that into a receptacle. It doesn't have, it's an older product. It doesn't have GFCI in the cord or anything like that. Now, what they did in 422, I still have it open. Uh, they said that on, on you have an option. You can put GFCI in the brand circuit. And in my opinion, that's outside of their purview. It's my personal opinion. I'm, I'm on my soapbox. I might as well, I might as well put the soapbox off on a little bit higher, higher of a thing here because the branch went within the branch circuit. I two ten dot eight in the the panel two guys are are over two are over the branch circuit. So they tell you that's one option within the branch circuit. Another option is which with a device or outlet 
within the supply circuit. So that's the outlet, which the GFCI receptacle would fix that. An integral part of the attachment plug. So now, here's what here's my issue. I didn't put GFCI protection on that receptacle, which is going to go for that dishwasher. And an electrical inspector goes in and says, where's your GFCI? And he says, I'm going to get the appliance is going to have it. Yeah, that's the ticket. Yeah, yeah, the appliance manufacturer. I'm going to buy an appliance. I'm going to get an LG in it. And it has it in the cord. Yeah, 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 that, that, that's what it is, you know. And, and then what's the inspector do? Oh, okay. The inspectors are going to be there when they plug the daggone thing in, right? Uh, he, he, and, 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 so, and so even if they did buy a, a dishwasher that has GFCI in the cord, it's not a part of the standard to have it in the cord. So if I go out and buy another one, another brand, maybe that brand had it in the cord, another brand doesn't. I buy that one, I plug it in, I have no GFCI protection. So my argument is 210, 210.8 puts it in the branch circuit. You're buying, you're building a new home and you intend to put a dishwasher in. I don't care what vintage it is. When you plug it in, you're going to be afforded GFCI protection. Now, if the standard wants to change, they can do that as part of 422, perfectly fine. But the moment you start giving options, I think you're, you're bound to have a problem where you, you know you have a hazard. And what happened, the reason we've got these appliances in there in the first place was because we had a very large appliance manufacturer come to panel two and open the kimono a little bit. And they said, look, we tried to change the standard to get GFCI required in the standard. It didn't happen because most of the people don't want to change their products, right? So they're going to argue against that heavily. And they said, look, here's the failure rate. Here's what's going on. These things don't fail in a safe mode. And, we, and, and they have no control. The manufacturer doesn't have any control. I've got a 1959 Wurlitzer jukebox. 1959. I have it on a GFCI receptacle. I have a 1956 or whatever. Uh, it's got General Motors on it, which is really cool. It's a refrigerator. It's, 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 a, it's an old refrigerator. I have that plugged into a GFCI receptacle. Okay? Those appliances are going to go with me every house I go to. I'm not going to say I'm leaving my Wurlitzer jukebox in this house. So... But in any case, when you put it into the branch circuit, it's there for anything you plug into it. That's my soapbox. I'm sticking to it. And um, I know there are people that don't agree with me, and that's fine. You know, you don't have to agree with me. So in any case, um, so that's that's where my head's at on that one. Uh, so let's take a look. Uh, boat and Yacht. Thank you for the Boat and Yacht AB. A, B, I got to remember how to say that right. A, B, Y, C. Please go check out uh, Lucas Ritz's story. Please. It's four minutes. Four minutes. Uh, specifically permits the fire alarm branch circuit to be locked on, but does not require it to be, neither does NFP 72, right? You know what? And if you've got to look at, uh, uh, and we'll look at it on Monday, uh, the requirement for um, elevator disconnect switches. And the, and the reason that came up, I had an individual, one of our pieces of equipment has a hole at the top and bottom of the switch and it was rejected. And uh, I think it was in Massachusetts. Those guys are really good out there. And, and the inspector, the contractor came back and said, Hey, you know, your equipment was rejected. Uh, I need to make it so that I can't lock it in the on position. And I went back to the code and said, there's nothing that says that you can't aren't permitted to. Uh, but the inspector stuck to his guns. He said, yep, it's not in the code, but it is in my, <laughs> not in Shelby County. So uh, we actually created a retrofit to block off that, and uh, it's a recognized component, and we can make that happen. So we had to modify our equipment just to satisfy that uh, installation, and I'm glad now it's in the code because now it adds clarity, and I can tell my, my, menu, my plant people, you need to do that and fix it. Uh, what about locking the breaker in the on position uh, that feeds the fire alarm panel? Okay, we are, I see the dialogue on that one. Nobody said anything about the quiz because we all assumed we received 100%. Mr. Neitzel, nope, you didn't. Um, oh, then we have Ron Shapiro, the bird on a wire. Yep, built in the piece, built it one piece at a time. All right. Mr. Abbasi, thank you for joining. No additional listing required by New York City beyond what NEC requires. Strange that breakers do not need to be listed unless they're reconditioned. Yep. The listing requirement 248 doesn't apply to medium voltage or high voltage because it's not in part nine. Exactly, Ryan. Opportunities. You don't want to be perfect. 
you know, I'm, and people say, Tom, you, you screwed up here. Tom, you screwed up there. Yeah, you know, I'm not perfect because I got to have room for improvement. You got to have room for improvement. When you're perfect, I mean, geez. Uh, you might be like, you know, I don't know. You have an MCC cubicle with an MCC and motor starter. Removing the motor starter is the MCC cubicle okay uh, to use without a label from the manufacturer? Um, it depends on your AHJ. Um, you know, if you have to, if, like I say, so you, you have an MCC cubicle with a motor, MCCB, motor case circuit breaker and motor starter and control wiring feeding a motor and you remove the motor starter and control wiring. Is the MCC cubicle okay to use without a label from a manufacturer? So you removed it, you reconditioned it, you basically, you created something new is what you did, in my opinion. You took out the starter, you took out the wiring, you just have the multi-case circuit breaker uh, in that panel. Um, it depends on what you're serving. I don't know, I'm not sure how I would handle that one. I mean, you have a new, you have a new, you have a different product, in my opinion. So... I mean, you could make an argument to say, especially if you're not providing it to a motor, if you're like just supplying power to something outside. I mean, that's a good question. Is the MCC cubicle okay to use without a label from the manufacturer? I'm going to have to think about that one, James. I'm not sure. I don't know if uh, anybody else has an opinion on that. Use, uh, use the live chat to help James out. Infrared viewing window. Um, I believe that adding, an, and this is Trent Fulton, I believe that adding an infrared viewing window does violate the listing, would have to be reinspected. I think you should check the instructions. Uh, a lot of our equipment will have guides on how to install those viewing windows. Um, again, anytime you make a modification that is governed, that, that you have instructions on how to do, uh, you are uh, following manufacturer's instructions. If you don't have those instructions and you start cutting holes in equipment, I would agree with you, Trent. Uh, you're dealing with something that you might need to get looked at um, in the field. I, my, my advice is uh, when you order the equipment, order it with the viewing windows. Order it with those little absence uh, or presence of voltage uh, indicators as well. Those are all safety items. A TIA, Technical Interim Amendment. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to, we still have 180 people online. Um, I'm going to give a definition. So what a T technical interim amendment is, if you, um, if you looked at the national electrical code, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to show you something here. Let me show you something. Um, it's actually, if you look, I'm hoping and if I go to NFPA, I go to NFPA.org and I go to www.nfpa.org slash 70. Okay. I know I'm covering up that code, but uh, hopefully you wrote it down now. I mean, it's what, 13 minutes after you guys are troopers hanging in there. Um, so if I go to the National Electrical Code site and I go to, uh, I say, current and prior editions. And you scroll down when it's done loading and thinking, I'm taxing my system. Okay, so here is here it is. Here's one. Soliciting public comments on proposed technical interim amendment number 1502, referencing 356.108. Uh, the closing date is May 11th, so we still have time. So let's uh, view it. Let's see what this uh, little guy is. There's the, it, 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 when you hit view, it'll download a, a PDF to your computer. You know what we're going to call this? We're going to call this like extra material. This is extra credit. This is extra credit. So here's the language of the TIA. Technical interim amendment. Uh, submitter is Megan Hayes the, from NEMA, National Electrical Manufacturers Association. And this is what uh, the NEMA is proposing. In 356.10.8, Conductors or cables rated at temperature at a temperature higher than the listed temperature rating of liquid uh, F LFNC L conduit shall be permitted to be installed in LFNC. So the, the, what they're trying to do is get uh, this language that's underscored. So you have to use uh, what they call that legislative text. And look, you're not even seeing it. Sorry, guys on YouTube. Um, so what did I just do? Hold on. 
Hold on. This is what happens when uh, you're live. Uh, and close TIA. I think I closed it. All right. So higher than the list at a temperature. And then, um, so the revision, and then, and then they have to give substantiation. So this is just like a public input, right? So this is, this probably was not discussed during the code panel meetings, but somebody said there's an issue with this. And then they have to show a few things. And I'll, I'll, as we scroll down, we'll show you this. The revision accepted by panel uh, submitted by NEMA was incorrectly recalled. This is an so it was looked at. The highlight text from the PI is not included. So this is um, something that they caught that wasn't included. So they had to do a technical interim amendment to put this back in. There's the public input. There's the first revision. So what their argument is that uh, it wasn't accepted there and it was incorrectly omitted. The task group report had it in, but... Uh, uh, Terra, for some reason, did not put it in. Terra is the software they use. So basically, what you do in a TIA is you plead your case. You have to show what the emergency nature is. Uh, the standard contains an error or omission that was overlooked. And it says, as currently covered in the 2020, conductors of a temperature rating higher than that of the uh, LFNC are not permitted. Such prohibition never existed, was never proposed, nor was it considered at any point in the process. So they have to show that it's an, what the emergency nature is, and then anybody can submit a comment on this if you agree or disagree. Um, and, and that's basically what a TIA is. It, it is a way to change the, the code. And then if it passes, so you can look, you can scroll down through here. These are all issued amendments. So there's an issued amendment in 725, in 21052 C2, 725.121. Let's take a look at... Uh, 21052C2. Let's look at that one. So these things changed the code. This was an accepted change. And this was panel 10. I remember voting on this one. Uh, this says, uh, we forgot to put the perpendicular wall in uh, as the measurement point. So we, we did everything except we didn't say where you take the measurement from. So what this TIA did was add, a peninsular countertop shall be measured from the connected per perpendicular wall. And the, uh, that was the language, and, and you would have to look and see uh, that the text of the TI was issued and approved for incorporation into the document prior to printing. So this TIA was done before the book was even printed. So if you have a first edition book, it includes this language already because we were so good that we recognized our screw up very fast. Uh, so that's basically you know, what a TIA is. And I would highly recommend that you walk down through this site. You can see errat erratas. You can, you can print these and download them and put them in your book to make sure that you have those on file. Uh, but again, all of these erratas and all of these TIAs that might be out there, look at this, there's a lot. I mean, your book may not have some of these TIAs and, and, and erratas. So, uh, you know, it's important that... And that's the value, I think, of uh, having, a, having it online. Read the highlights, and then there's archived revision. You can see the first draft report. You can see the second draft report. So if you ever wondered why a change occurred, you just go in here. So let's take a look at the second draft. It'll call up TerraView. Uh, TerraView is their software, and it'll ask you to log in, but they don't charge for logging in. And these are, uh, you can go into any one of these articles, and if they let's say you saw something in 2.10, uh, like that definition was moved. So there's the definition of dormitory that was apparently deleted, and you can say it was moved. If you pull this up, it will give you all of the reasons why that was changed. So definition, dormitory unit, and here's, uh, Here's the, it's a panel two. The term dormitory unit is being moved to Article 100 as it's used more in one location. And then here are all the public comments that drove that change. And you can tell that it passed ballot. There were 14 eligible to vote, 11 affirmative, one affirmative con comments, and two negative comments. And here's all your affirmatives. So Chris Pavisi, uh, Charlie Boynton, Nihad El Sharif, who's on the phone call with us today. Uh, you have Steve Campolo and I, uh, I again, I, uh, I, this was my comment, and Steve Campolo from Leviton, he had a comment on there as well. So you can see all of that history right here. 
if you ever wondered why uh, something changed, anybody in the general public can uh, come out and look at that. So uh, this is your lesson in 101 on uh, on uh, on on the National Electrical, and you can do this for any of the documents. 70E is the same way. You can see all of the first draft. You can see the ballots, what passed, and what the comments were. This is all just really good information. You can see who's on the technical panel. Uh, the next edition is open for public inputs, and you can see the revision cycle. This tells you public input closing date is going to be September 10th of this year. So 9:10. You have up until 9:10 to make comments. Uh, and then you just click on submit. A, uh, I'll just give you a little lesson on how to make a change here. So we're going to make a change. We're going to we're going to come in here and say in Article 90, introduction, uh, the purpose, and we're going to say we're going to we're going to modify the purpose. We're going to revise an existing section, and we're going to say. I don't know if Ryan Jackson's still out there, but we're going to throw Ryan Jackson under the bus. Right? So here's the, the language. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, we're going to add a, uh, we're going to add a D, and we're going to say, Ryan Jackson approval. Okay, the requirements in this code must be approved by Ryan Jackson. Okay, and then you hit next, and it'll show you your change. There it is, and then, you know, obviously we can't do the bolding and some of the stuff like that. We let, we let Terra view and stuff like that, and the, the panel will deal with that. And then uh, once you feel comfortable with that, you have to put in any uploaded information, and then you have to come up with your substantiation. You're going to say, well, why? What, what is this? Well, we're going to say, uh, you know, Ryan is, uh, is a good guy. and um, and 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 we love him, and uh, and we think uh, uh, he should uh, review all installations, right? So I'm gonna say that's 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 our substantiation, and we're gonna add any related public inputs, and then we're gonna come in here, and this is gonna tell you this is you're the submitter. Here's who you work for. Uh, so we're gonna verify you. And we're going to say, yep, I, uh, I check, I affirm that I am Thomas Dimitrovich, and we're going to say submit. And uh, there's my public input. So it's right here on 90. And if I go to my public inputs, I can say all of my unsubmitted and submitted public inputs. There's all of my uh, submitted and unsubmitted public inputs. And there's my 90.1. I can view that one. And uh, there's my change, D. There's my substantiation. Ryan's a good guy, and we love him, and we think uh, he should review all installations. There's my name. And so that's, an, a, that's a formal public input that's been submitted to uh, the uh, to the NEC. And, and Ryan, although I, I do love you, buddy, I am not going to do that. All right. So that is how you put a public input in. It's very simple to do. Um, you can, uh, you know, uh, go into the code and any of these sections and just, you know, you, you, you make the changes, you change what you think you need to change, put in your substantiation, and that's, that's how it's done. It's not that hard. I think TerraView made it uh, very easy for public inputs to be made. So uh, there's no excuse. There's no excuse to, uh, to make changes uh, to, the, you know, when you find something that's wrong in the National Electrical Code. So hopefully that helps everybody, um, and you and you understand that, uh, and uh, that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, Ryan, you got your your wife will love that. Then uh, just stop the video before you hit uh, before I deleted it. Okay, so for all of you uh, you good uh, YouTubers out there, thank you for hanging in there. I am going to um, I'm going to play my outro. Uh, and uh, I would just want to say thank you to everybody who, uh, let me do this. Uh, I want to just say thank you to everybody who uh, who stuck in there. We have, uh, let's see how many people we have. We have, uh, let's see, we have how many live streamers we got. 130 live streamers. 
thanks to everybody out there. And um, thanks for hanging in there all the way to the end. I appreciate it. Hopefully you're getting something out of these. And uh, we'll take care. And I'm going to play the outro. See ya. Right. So I'm glad that that's over, huh? We got uh but everybody's still streaming up there. Thanks everybody for dialing in. I'm just going to say uh there's my YouTubers, my tubers. Don't forget Breaker Basics tomorrow. You're going to love that class. Thanks, David Platt. We need to work together to change receptacle outlet to receptacle in 210.52. You might be right, Ryan. Send me a note on that. Love to look at what you got going on there. Uh, you're welcome, Brian Chambliss. Uh, Baram, uh, I'll take a look at I think you sent me an email. I'm going to try to get all of that done uh, tonight and possibly tomorrow. It might take me a little bit. Got a lot of stuff here. I'll see you tomorrow, Kerry. Or K R R Y. Campbell. Just Campbell. You're welcome, David. Thank you. All right. We've got a lot of good people. Thanks a lot, Ryan. He's on. Glad I have uh, some of these little blocks on. You wouldn't believe what people are wanting to share. Well, we got a lot of good chatting going on. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So I'm going to stop sharing on my thing. I'm going to save. And I already said goodbye to everybody on there, but there's 86. So I'm going to end the stream. Everybody on uh, YouTube, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop streaming here. Thank you, and have a good evening. Stay safe.